I live in Eastern Europe, more exactly in Romania. You may have heard about those gypsy witches that live in my country. Most of them are just pretending to be something they're not. This, however, is the story of a real witch. My grandmother used to live in the same village with a witch. I don't know if the witch was a gypsy or Romanian, but it doesn't really matter. She lived for so many years that no one knew her age. This woman claimed to be a witch, and she had also claimed that she had this demon who served her. She used to talk about the way she sold her soul one night in the forest while performing a ritual. In return, she gained powers and the help of a demon. She said that she couldn't die until she convinced someone to take full charge and responsibility of her duty as a witch and sell his or her soul to the darkness as well. She, I believe, had three daughters, but people said that their mother's behavior scared them away. They moved to Bucharest and never returned to the village. Now, you will say that she was most likely a crazy old woman, but no. A lot of people heard weird noises coming from her attic, and she agreed that the sounds were made by her slave demon. People, even though afraid, asked her to solve their problems and gave her money for doing so. No one ever complained about her work. No one. Everything was put in place no matter how difficult the task was. People witnessed a lot of hard work getting done overnight in her yard and garden things that she wasn't able to do alone. My grandmother met a woman on her way to work. The woman asked my grandmother about the witch. She wanted to know where the witch lived. My grandma gave indications and then asked her why she was going to go see her. She said that a thief broke into her house and stole her savings, and she wanted her money back. The next day, my grandmother met the woman again. She carried a bag and my grandma asked her what happened. She said that she went to the witch and received the promise that she would be able to find the money on the table when she returned home. The witch asked in advance for half the money. The woman agreed. It was better than nothing. And things happened exactly as the witch foretold. And she carried the promised money in the bag on the way to the witch's house. Another story is that a woman fell in love with a married man. She went to the witch and told her that she wanted that man. The witch asked her if she wanted the man no matter what the consequences were. She said yes, and in less than a month, his wife got ill and passed. He remarried, and he got married to the woman who asked for his wife to fall. That's why she was seen as a powerful and real witch. For sure, she had some supernatural powers. Unfortunately, I don't know if she's still alive. I've experienced several things throughout my 36 years that could be unexplained supernatural occurrences. When I was a kid in particular, I had some recurring harassment that would make me afraid to be in my room. Enough so, that my mother purchased me one of those little red bed tents that us kids in the 80s liked so well. I ran into some odd situations while at sea in the Navy too. Anyway, I had essentially forgotten about most of my previous experiences I had, because I became somewhat of a close-minded skeptic. Even weird things that cropped up as an adult, I noted were odd and that I couldn't explain, but I would dismiss them as just being personally unaware of the science behind whatever it was that I'd be witnessing. Three years and maybe some change ago, the VA accidentally declared me dead, which had just been one in a series of negative events in my life that had started a sort of decline in my expectations for what the future could hold. During that time, a buddy of mine who was like a brother that I had known since I was six, moved in with me. 
As his life was also spiraling downwards, together one night, we decided to watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to summon demons and trade things for a better future. I also had two girls related to an ex girlfriend of mine who needed to escape their abusive family living with me in my finished basement. The basement had no entry from the house, you have to leave the house just to access it. So it was like their own little apartment. And a good deal for a 21 year old and 18 year old, considering how I let them stay rent free, as long as they helped with my sons, helped with cleaning, and cooked two meals a week. They come into this later. For now they were just the ones that had suggested to my buddy and myself that we should look for videos about bargaining with the supernatural. The videos weren't particularly helpful. But we decided to start easy and went with the poor man's Ouija, the game called Charlie. I'm sure everyone is aware of what it is. But just in case you're not, you place a pencil on a piece of paper, split it into four squares with yes and no written in opposite corners. One pencil sits in the center, and the other pencil is balanced on top of it. Then you say things like Charlie is X true. And then the top pencil is supposed to spin gently towards the yes or no answer. We did this a few times. And we had enough success that my buddy actually posted a video of the pencil turning on its own to his Facebook account. Invigorated by our success, and the potential to gain loot from whatever we made a deal, we smoked a bunch of super dank reefer and came up with what could essentially be our trade template. We were operating under the assumption that everyone who traded their soul to the devil had done such in a rush to be famous or rich, that they didn't care about their part of the trade, or how unbalanced it might be for them. We came up with a 30 for 30 trade. You see, I was around 33 when we decided on this, and figured 30 years really wasn't that bad to live as a soul enslaved to a malevolent entity, for a trade of 30 years alive as a successful human. That bargain in mind, I bothered my cat until it scratched me enough for me to bleed, and I pressed my thumb into the cut, and then onto the Charlie paper. This, I believe, was the catalyst for the rest of the weird stuff that had continued to this day. My buddy refused to put his own blood on the paper. He was raised Christian, and steadily became less involved and more just a witness as I pushed forward. I don't remember verbatim what I said. But essentially I laid out my deal, my expectations and my offering. I offered up 30 years of service to whatever after my death, for 30 years of wealth and influence. I didn't want fame. Fame seemed like more work than it's worth. I just wanted to have enough loot to make sure my two sons, who live with me 100% of the time, were taken care of forever and that I could live out the rest of my days feeling successful because I had loot, regardless of how I got to obtaining it. The pencil didn't spin. The lights did not flicker. There was no sudden cold breeze. My buddy and I did have a simultaneous sensation of being watched however. We both turned around to see if the girls had come into the house, or if one of my sons had woken up. Nothing. We were alone. My buddy slept on one of the sofas, and I fell asleep on my recliner sofa in front of my coffee table, where the bloody Charlie game was at rest. I slept easy, even though I felt a bit uneasy, as if someone was staring at me as I urinated. That's kinda how I felt, but nonetheless slept. When I awoke, I followed my usual routine. I didn't even consider the night before until I grabbed my coffee cup. My buddy was still asleep. I typically wake up earlier than anyone else in the house, and I sat down in the same spot I had slept. And as I went to place my coffee down, I noticed an odd handprint on my coffee table facing me. The fingertips were pointed towards where I had slept. I actually took a picture of it because it was so strange. 
It was smaller than my handprint. The fingers were thinner, and there were only four digits, three thumbs and a finger. The weird part was, the nails seemed to have left an impression on the table too, as there were pointed claw looking impressions. When I say impressions, I don't mean the wooden table was scarred. What I mean is its dark surface, and it looked like someone had placed a hot, sweaty, oddly shaped hand there, not long enough to leave a smudgy white imprint. That's why the claw impression just being there seemed odd. That, and only one hand impression was there. Not two, just the one four digit hand. I put my hand next to it. My hands were much too big. My buddy's hands were too big. And my youngest hands were too small. My oldest son's hands were too small. The girls came up from the basement and before they told me about their night, I interrupted them and had them put their hand next to the impression on the table. Both hands were too small. Then they told me that I had kept them up all night. They thought my buddy and I had gotten drunk and were jamming out to 90s rock and metal. Truth be told, that's a legitimate assumption. We do that. But the night prior, we hadn't. In fact, we hadn't had a single drink, and we had turned off the videos after we came across the Charlie game. The only noise had been us talking excitedly at some points. The girls, however, said that there was a bunch of loud thumping and constant heavy music. In their words, but they consider corn heavy music. The 18 year old swore she thought that we had legitimately had a party going on with even more of our friends. My sons, however, heard nothing. It was weird, but we all sort of dismissed it as odd and noteworthy, but nothing more. That night, my buddy and I looked at some more videos about demons and bargaining with them. We watched a video that claimed that just by watching you, you were participating in a demonic summoning. As the night went on, things around the house seemed more uneasy. My buddy and I were both feeling unnerved, and every noise the house made seemed unnatural. Eventually, we turned on Aqua Teen Hunger Force and passed out. The same places as the night before. The following morning, the coffee table that I had since wiped down, erasing the previous prints, now had two of the same impressions on it, both facing me as the ones from the previous morning. The only noticeable difference is that there were two prints, and that the thumbs were again in the same place as the human thumbs. However, once again, only four digits and odd claws pointed towards where I had slept. My eldest son immediately became worried and claimed that I was being haunted by the rake from the famous creepypasta. I confessed, creepypastas are whack to me, so I wasn't familiar with this story at the time, and I took time to watch a few versions explaining it. I wasn't impressed, and it didn't resonate with me as a sensible answer to what I had been witnessing. Only the claws and the insinuation that something had been watching me fit. The girls claimed to have another rough night this time. However, it wasn't noises upstairs. It was the lights in the basement turning on and off and the sound of something scratching at their door and one door that leads outside in the woods at the edge of my property. We live in the woods on a mountain with a few acres of land. So the idea of something scratching on the door isn't too far from likely. I've even had bears roam my land so something scratching at the door is certainly not unheard of around here. The girls continued having nights of being freaked out. Despite that, after the third morning of handprints, I had stopped being involved with any odd event. The girls grew so frightened they moved upstairs and slept on the other two sofas. So now the four adults in the house slept in the living room, while my son slept in their own rooms. I have my own bedroom, but I just don't like sleeping in beds. The girls continued to have odd experiences in the bathroom, feeling like they were being watched. The shower curtain being pulled back when no one was in the room. My sons both woke up with what appeared to be cat scratches on their chest one morning. They seemed superficial enough, but they were spooked. 
because my cats will suffer anything, except me using them to dust tables. That's how I got them to scratch me for the original game of Charlie. One night, all four of us heard the scratching at the door, this time on the upstairs door, and not the basement. As a combat vet, I have firearms, so my buddy and I step outside and search the immediate area. We kept hearing rustling, so we followed it around the edge of the property, until we got down by the basement. We both noticed the light was on, but my buddy was the first to notice movement through the windows. In order to prevent air leaks, the few windows the basement has are covered with weatherproof plastic, so we could only make out the shadow of a head moving back and forth. Whoever it was, certainly didn't belong in my basement, and especially not at night time. We came around the door, which was already opened, and yelled into the basement that we were armed, and that by coming forward now, they would be safely escorted from the property, whereas jumping out could lead to being injured. But there was no response. No sound, but all the lights were on, and the door had been wide open. The majority of my basement is open space, with just one finished room, save a missing door. The older girl had stayed there, and she had hung a blanket in place of a door. My buddy was standing behind me, and when I moved the blanket hanging in the door, all the lights in the basement shut off. A totally audible snap too. My buddy called out, What is it? and ran outside, and I followed him out behind his movements later. He was genuinely spooked when I came out, and told me he had run out because he was certain I had pushed past him in the dark, and ran out ahead of him. So when he said, what is it? He thought he was talking to me running past him, despite the fact I hadn't moved until he left the basement. I closed the door and put a cement block in front of it. We went back upstairs, put the rifles away, and described what happened. Upstairs, the power had gone out too, but when the girls had gone to the breaker box, which is upstairs in a broom closet by some weird 70s design, the power came back on without an issue. Perhaps to the basement as well, though I'm unsure whether we noticed it did or not. The girls moved out. They still keep in touch and visit, but won't stay overnight because they're afraid of whatever I did. They definitely think I lost something when I tried to make a deal. I've repeatedly pointed out to them that I've received no such bounty as stated in the deal I offered, and they pointed out that just a couple of months after the Charlie game, the VA finally fixed their mistake about my status and began paying me again. They also noted that soon after the game my writing had been noticed, and I have been making money with that, and gained a smallish following. They also pointed out that my buddy sold his house. Yes, he had a house even though he was living with me, and for a life-changing amount of money, which he used to travel for a while before coming back to this area. There continue to be odd circumstances around the house. We've seen odd footprints in snow and mud outside of the house on the patio, and around the cars. We've heard noises in the basement and around the house. Once, the steps to the attic had been pulled down and left open for some reason. I wake up sometimes with inexplicable scratches on my head, arms or legs, but again all superficial, I don't have any scars from them. At this point I can't rule out cats. I'd scratch me in my sleep too, if I'm used for a dust rag for kicks. The running joke is that Charlie needs to come out of his pockets if he's going to harass the household. My life is on the upturn now, but I certainly didn't receive what I was expecting for the offer I made. The girls have told me they think I let something loose that is essentially angry with me that my deal isn't weighted in its favour, so it's stuck being a minor annoyance. While I make fun of it for not giving me any of my loot, 30-30 is a fair trade, and I stand by it, and it'll need to make more than a trivial paw print to change my mind on that. 
I grew up in South Texas, more widely known as the Rio Grande Valley. I'm the youngest of three kids and we all lived with our mom and stepdad in a great big red brick house. It was quite a culture shock moving from the piney woods of East Texas, all the way to the flat desert like lands of the RGV. There were hardly any trees, mostly just palm trees and shrubs. We saw a cactus here and there and the wildlife consisted mostly of jackrabbits, rattlesnakes and armadillos. When we started school, we learned quickly that the people there were superstitious to say the least. I was in second grade when we moved into that house on Jackie Street. And right from the beginning, I felt an unease. I used to be a happy go lucky kid with nothing to worry about. I made friends with all the neighborhood kids. And I even became best friends with a girl who lived directly behind us. She had the most superstitious family out of anyone I'd ever met. She was the eldest of four girls, and their mother was very overly protective, at least in my eyes. She wouldn't let them watch Harry Potter, because it is associated with witchcraft. They went to church three times a week, and they didn't celebrate Halloween. With all that being said, the mum loved to tell ghost stories and Mexican folklores. It was one of the coolest things about her. And the thing I loved most about visiting their home. One night she told us the story of La Mujer Lechusa. Basically, in my own words, it's about a witch or bruja that can turn into a large owl. Typically, it will transform into an owl with a woman's head, or a large owl the size of a human, with a few things that are off putting. If you see a lechusa, you're supposed to pray for your life in Spanish. And supposedly, it should leave you be. It's also been known to make a whistling sound like a human whistling. If you answer it back with a whistle of your own, it will swoop down and carry you away. If you wake up in the morning and see large scratches on your doors or windowsills, it means that the lechuza was there and is coming for you. So you must prepare yourself accordingly. I can't whistle. And my friend's mum knew this. So she would jokingly tell me I wouldn't have anything to worry about. She would also lovingly tell my friends and I that we are gorditas and that we couldn't be carried away easily, which means we're carrying a little bit of extra weight around the middle, if you know what I mean. After years of hearing these stories in various ways from teachers, other friends, parents, and in books, it was about as stuck in my head as any old wives tale. I would get excited hearing about it around Halloween and at school. It was just another scary story to give kids an adrenaline rush. I never thought that they were reality. This next thing happened in the summer of fifth grade. My best friend and I were on her trampoline. It was summer, maybe 10pm kind of late with a full moon up. We spent time talking and looking at the stars until we heard a whistling. We knew not to whistle back. Instead, we lay there frozen still looking at the sky and listening intently to the whistling coming from the distance. I look at my friend and she is paralyzed. She's praying in Spanish and squeezing my hand as tightly as possible. A few minutes go by and we hear more whistling. This time, getting closer. My friend stops praying and says we should get inside. I agree without hesitation. And we start inching towards the edge of the trampoline to escape. But in that moment, I hear it. And I'll never forget the bone rattling sound and the twisted images that scarred me for life. We felt the wind from its wings and saw it maybe 15 feet above our heads. A huge white snowy owl, maybe 12 feet wide from wingtip to wingtip floating right above us. Its eyes were jet black and it mostly looked like an owl. At its feet, they were human, but had long black talons that seemed to twitch as it was cold. Demonic eyes stared down at its prey. It locked eyes with me and let out a screech. My heart jumped up to my neck. 
and I've never ran inside so fast. We cried together while praying as we heard it continue to flap around outside. We held on to each other with her rosary in our hands and continued praying as loudly as we could. When all of a sudden, it was gone. On to find its next victim, no doubt. We're both terrified of owls to this day. We don't even look at them in books. Every time I see one, I think of the face of the lechuza, almost human and almost owl, a strange demonic hybrid not of this world. Believe the tales, don't go outside alone, and never respond to strange whistling. Something might just snatch you up and carry you far, far away. The year of 2013. I moved into one of the four houses that came from Stephenson Island in the late 1800s. A lot of loggers had died on that island. Well, I was supposed to get the basement for my room. As soon as I stepped into that house, an eerie presence hit me. I felt uneasy. The feeling grew worse descending into that basement. The crawl space was boarded off. I was a very depressed teenager, cutting, debating ending it all, you know, the fun stuff. What I didn't know was something was feeding off it. My room at night had an eerie feeling. I kept the lights completely off and immediately went to sleep after this because you would see figures of people in the room standing over you and watching you intently. At this time, I believe they were merely curious about my family's presence in the house. Basically them wondering what we were doing at their place. So skip forward half a year later. Weird occurrences start happening. I lost my sketchbook and my sketchbook is my baby and I would never lose that. I also had shavers being thrown at me in the shower. My brother and I were sitting on the couch playing video games during the end of winter and heard metal scraping across the attic floor above us. Now I know that sound. It wasn't just any metal, it was a metal chair scraping across a wooden floor. I tell my brother and he doesn't want to believe it. Fast forward a few more months, I finally find my sketchbook in the weirdest place because for one, I'm always in my room because my depression is eating me alive. And two, I would never place my sketchbook so perfectly in front of the door. I came home, opened my door and there the thing was in front of the door perfectly in the middle. I felt weird but shrugged it off. A week later, my brother left his bowl of mac and cheese in the kitchen. He came back and watched it stop moving towards the edge of the counter. He doesn't believe in this type of stuff, but even he can't explain that. I started becoming more of a positive and happy person and then moved out into the living room to sleep because my mother and father cannot sleep in the same bed anymore comfortably due to her sickness. So my dad took the room. I took the living room and the first night I was petrified. Yes, my brother slept on the other couch, but I was scared, very scared. I had a direct view into the kitchen where the basement was, and if I tried looking another way, I'd see into the bathroom. So I thought, let's just look in the bathroom instead. Wrong. I was so wrong it was almost bad. You could see figures going back and forth, and I ended up shutting the door like the chicken that I am. But then bam. I wanted to take pictures because it calms me down. I happened to be using Snapchat. I didn't think anything of these pictures until people began messaging me, saying things like, what the hell is that? There's a demon thing standing in your kitchen. So personally, I felt scared. I went to bed that night only to be struck by sleep paralysis. I had sleep paralysis for a month non-stop. This is where things got really bad. I lay on my couch stuck, not being able to move, scream, and just look around frantically. 
This creature lifted me up and made me levitate, and opened my legs and started tugging at the hem of my skinny jeans, as I used to wear skinny jeans to bed, because I didn't have pyjamas, but I had skinny jeans. Another spirit intervened and threw the creature down. I, still in the air, finally get out of the sleep paralysis, fall and hit my head, got up and ran into my mother's room scared and crying. Imagine a 14 or 15 year old asking if they can sleep with you, because of sleep paralysis. After that night, I started to not sleep as much. I didn't want to sleep after that, but I give in one night and regret that night. I awoke to my cat, my cat's bed being dragged away from me towards the basement. I had it. I'd had it with this thing. It could mess with me, but not my baby. I threatened to seal it away in the basement and attic if it didn't stop messing around with my family and our cats. It's one thing to mess with me, but my family and cats is something else. I told it I didn't want to seal it away, but that we could live in harmony together. Luckily, it stopped everything besides the shadow creatures and occasionally hiding my shirt and throwing shavers at me. Ever since I moved out, my family has had very few problems with this entity. The shadow creatures will not leave my father alone. He recently told me he felt the same way about that room and that if you ever open your eyes, you can see a figure hovering over the bed. My brother leaves the bedroom door closed so I'm sure he doesn't want to admit he's having issues with shadow creatures as well. Recently, I had a terrible nightmare triggered by the ghost at my job, and it took me back to an event that happened in Snyder County, Pennsylvania, back between 2010 and 2015. I was between the ages of 13 to 18. Those five years were an absolute hell and tore my family apart. Many things happened at this house, ranging from violent enough to push my dad down the stairs to simple cold spots. However, the story I'm going to share is the night that stuck with me the most. In 2008, when the market crashed and people started losing their houses, my family was a part of it. I watched my parents struggle for a long time before finally giving up and moving closer to my school district, where we started renting the right side of a duplex. To give a bit of an image of the house, it consisted of three stories above the ground and a basement. The first floor had a closed off porch, a large divided living room, a very small kitchen, and a small closed off back porch. At the kitchen entrance was the food closet, and directly across from that was the door to the basement. Upstairs were three bedrooms and a full bathroom. Every room upstairs had a carpet in it, except for my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. Yes, even the bathroom was carpeted. Through the room closet to the bathroom, my brother's room was the door to the attic. The attic was a large room that we never used, and because it would open on its own accord, my brother pushed his dresser in front of it. At the other half of the house was an elderly lady and her daughter. The two fought almost every night, and after they moved out, they hired a man to fix up their side and sell it. Well, he invited my parents and I over one day to tell us what he had planned to work on. So he was really letting us know that it was going to be noisy for a while. He showed us a room in the basement that was painted all black with colours painted throughout it as well as candles and a Ouija board at the center. He had thrown that stuff out before we could even see it though. Now that you have the layout of the house, let me begin the event that haunts me to this day. It was a clear night on Wednesday, about 7 or 8 p.m. My parents were a part of pool league, so they were out that night. My brother was basically living with my cousin at the time too, so I was completely home alone with three dogs and what I strongly believe was a demon. I was sitting in my father's favorite chair. The chair faced the kitchen, and I was a typical teenager texting on my phone and watching TV, when I heard what sounded like the dogs getting into the garbage out in the darker than usual kitchen. 
This was pretty common since our boxer Max liked to pull empty bottles from the trash if we didn't give them to him. He likes to take the lids off. He'd give the caps to our two chihuahuas to play with while he played with the bottle. I yelled for the dogs to get back into the living room and out of the trash. It didn't stop the sound of rustling trash bags. So I was about to get up and go out there. But I looked down and see Max laying in front of the TV, while Scrappy and Kakoa, the chihuahuas, were curled on my mum's chair that faced the stairs. Sure, this spooked me a little, but I was used to this kind of thing. It became common for things to be the ghost if it wasn't the dogs. I did my best to ignore the sound and continued watching TV. However, my attention was snapped away when the light in that half of the divided living room started to dim and brighten repeatedly and fast. The feeling of being watched heightened around this time too. But again, the being watched feeling was something I had gotten used to. I began texting my mum, asking how much longer they were going to be out. She told me it wouldn't be too much longer, but I knew it wouldn't be until way later in the night. I continued to do my best to ignore it. But then it started to sound like someone was walking around upstairs in my room and in the hallway. I was not about to go investigate on my own. As a huge fan of horror, I knew that this would be unwise. Once again, I texted my mum and this time told her that the ghost was acting up and that I was getting scared. Deciding that it was getting to be too much for me. I moved to the other half of the living room where the couch was to try and get away from whatever it was. I used to sleep on the couch. So it was already set up for me to hide under the covers. I called all three dogs with me as well as an attempt to keep us all safe. I really wish I could say that that was where the event ended and that my parents came home right then and there. Above the half of the living room I had moved into was my parents bedroom. In their bedroom was a very heavy solid oak dresser and a just as heavy metal framed bed. I could hear what sounded like someone pushing around the dresser and bed. It sounded like someone was rearranging my parents bedroom. At this point, I could no longer ignore everything that was happening in the house. It honestly was as if the house was coming to life. And it was at that point I called my mum demanding she come home because something was very wrong and there was nothing I could do to make any of it stop. I think the whole it sounds like someone is rearranging your bedroom thing made her think someone might have broken in. But there's no way someone could have broken in and got up the stairs without me seeing them. Even if they did find a way onto the roof and into the house, I don't think they'd be quiet enough to make it undetected with three dogs. Either way, I had no other option than to try and hide and ignore it all. What felt like an eternity passed before my parents got home. And by the time they did everything had stopped. Once in the door, my dad went upstairs with my mum and I closed behind. We checked every room on the second floor, only to find no one there. And nothing had been changed or moved. Well, that was scary. But the events didn't stop there. The spectre wouldn't stop touching my mum's face one night. She said it felt like spider webs all over her and she couldn't get them off. My brother and mum were home one day. And my brother said, there's nothing actually here, right? To which the thing responded by opening a kitchen cupboard and then closing it. Another night, my mum had woken up from sleeping on her chair that faced the stairs. She thought Coco was coming down the stairs. So she called for him to come and join her, but the dog was already on her lap. When she looked up, the shadow coming down the stairs was gone. Every morning at 2.30am, the bathroom door upstairs would open or close. This is still unexplained because it was over carpet and it took a lot of force to open or close. My grandmother had given me a doll that would rock in a circle and play music, but you had to wind it up first. One day I was just chilling in my room, minding my own business and it started playing on its own. The attic window would open on its own too. And we never used the attic. We never used it to the point my brother pushed his dresser in front of the door. Like I said before, 
He did it to make sure the door would stop rattling. I was relaxing in the living room one night, and the mudroom door was swaying and me being an annoying teen shouted, Could you please stop with the door? And it stopped. My mum also demanded it leave us and the dogs alone. And she heard a very clear, loud single knock upstairs. Things were quiet after a while until the other side of the house was getting renovated. And then it came back worse than before. My dad was coming down the stairs one day, and it looked like he got pushed. He tried to catch himself, but he slid down the stairs and sliced his foot open on the radiator at the bottom. I mean, it could have been worse, I guess. One time in the middle of the day, I was just relaxing on the couch when my sleeping dog was thrown off the chair across the room with so much force, he was spun around facing the chair just as he was sleeping on. He landed on the floor right in front of the couch. The chair was rocking so fast and hard I'm surprised it didn't flip. The poor dog was so scared he hid behind the toilet on the back porch. We took him out the house for a few hours. And when he got home, he hid again. My dog also used to stare and follow things that were not there. Things would go missing too. Shortly after moving in, I would hear a voice saying my name quietly and a lot, usually in the kitchen, almost as if it were a whisper. The first week after we moved in, we heard what sounded like glass breaking, but it sounded like it was outside. So we called the cops and they looked around to find nothing. I later went to use the bathroom and found the glass around the light bulb had shattered in the sink, not a shard of glass anywhere else. This is impossible. Because there were four lights above the sink stretching far enough across that the first and last bulb were not over the sink at all. The last bulb should have hit the toilet if it fell. But like I said, it was the only glass around the bulb. The metal was still intact and turned on. This was the first sign of there being something wrong. My whole family fell into a depression while living there. And we were constantly fighting with each other. It was never like this before we moved into that house. Sure, we all had our problems. But it was like that house escalated very negative energy. My dad tried to end his own life while living there. I tried to do the same. And my brother straight up left. And I know my mum was giving up too, because she just wanted to leave everything and go. I strongly believe that house, or whatever entity our neighbor summoned that witch tore my family apart. Back in the summer of 2012, I was in my high school. And then over the summer break, I had become absolutely obsessed with this show called The Supernatural. The story of two brothers, Sam and Dean Winchester, hunting monsters and demons. It was my absolute favorite. I've always had a knack for digging deep into the paranormal world, a little too interested about the other side. And watching the show only piqued my interest in this. I do not know how many of you hearing this have actually watched it. And even if you haven't, I'll give you a little context regarding the next part of my story. So in the initial seasons, they used to show exorcisms and various rituals, chanting spells and all that jazz. Watching those really intrigued me. So I wanted to look into this a little more and see for myself if the spells and such were real. I had the power of the internet at my disposal. And so one day in the middle of the night, I hopped onto Google and started typing keywords like demon spell witchcraft, etc. After pursuing through the contents of various sites, I was getting tired. When I finally came across this one. Oh, I wish I could remember the name. The site had the most amazing spells, white magic to dark, summoning fairies to demons, it had it all. Being young and naive, I chanted the spells out loud. I started with fairies and moved on to demons. Yes, just a tiny detail. All these spells required a few ingredients or had to be performed a specific day under the moon or in the forest or whatever. I didn't follow any of these rules and went straight for the spells. 
The spells were long, and I have the attention span of a hummingbird, so I read them out loud for only half the spell, and by the time I was done, it was pretty late. So I crashed on my bed and fell asleep. I woke up the next morning with backaches, probably from sitting in front of the computer for too long, with three long nail marks on one of my thighs. It was red and sore. I immediately checked my own nails to rationalize the situation and saw my nails had not grown since the last time I had them trimmed and I sleep alone. This was the first incident which I brushed off. For that time, I went about with my day. Until later that night, I hopped on the computer and began going through those spells again. But tonight something happened. I couldn't sleep the entire night. I kept waking up in the middle of the night and thought I had a sinking feeling that I was being watched in my sleep or that there was someone standing near my bed. I could properly get some sleep when the sunlight creaked through the gaps of my windows when I finally woke. And what I encountered made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. There were three more marks this morning, long deep ones, three on my other thigh and three on my left arm. Now I was scared. I had watched enough horror films and TV series to know what was happening. I concluded that I was being haunted by some kind of evil entity. Why the marks otherwise? I guess I was reading out the spells and I had done it too diligently and actually summoned a demon. I told my parents what was happening and at first they didn't believe me. Then I showed them the marks and they tried to somehow rationalize it with me. I kept trying to convince them and this night I didn't dare open my computer and again, had more restless sleep, waking up often with the feeling of being watched. And again, the next morning, you guessed it, more red marks now on my right arm and a few on my back. Even though I had stopped going on the site and this ordeal continued for a few weeks before suddenly out of the blue, it stopped. I realized this because I could finally sleep peacefully again and there were no new marks. Over the years, I've shared this story to many people and no one could give me a proper answer as to why it happened or what it was. If you have any theories, I'd be grateful to hear them. My great grandmother, Emily, owned a house on Glenwood Avenue in Owasso. She was fairly well off, so she let my mum's mother move into her house when she was falling on hard times with her husband and their kids, and my great grandmother Emily moved out. I'm going to try to make this as easy to understand as possible to who is who. So I'm going to lay out who moved into the house first. My grandma Pat, who is my mother's mother, has three kids, Charlotte, my mother, Chris and James. She was married to a man called Butch, who also had three kids, Sandy, Lee and Greg, these are all events that my mum and grandma Pat both separately told me throughout my life. I'm 22 now and have told my friends about them through the years. I've been hearing these stories for a while and think it's time to share these experiences. I want to give a bit of information about my great grandma Emily when she lived there. She told my grandma that some strange things had been happening in the house when she was in bed. It felt like a cat walked over her and she had no animals. She told my grandma that something would tug her blanket at the end of her bed when she would have to clutch onto it to keep it there or it would be pulled off. Water would also run in the bathroom constantly and she would have to get up and turn it off throughout the night. My mum moved into the house and she made some friends around the neighborhood. They would tease her about how a witch lived there before and did witchcraft in the basement and said the house was haunted. My mum brushed it off thinking they were trying to scare her. My mum said that her and her stepsister Sandy shared a room and she said that red glowing eyes would look at them in the closet. My mum said they would be so scared that they would sleep in the same bed and Sandy even ran and flicked on the light 
and moved the toys around in the closet, thinking it was just a light. But as soon as the light would flick back off and Sandy got back into bed with my mum, they would reappear. My mum told me that they would pull long black hairs from the drywall leading to the staircase and that the drywall would literally just crumble. She also told me that one night my grandma Pat was waiting for her husband Butch to get home. She was watching TV in the living room and she was laying on a pull out bed. She sat up to get a drink of water and had her feet on the floor and something grabbed her ankle and squeezed. It shook her so hard from underneath the bed that it left a bruise. She looked under the bed thinking it was one of the kids and she saw nothing was there. So she yelled for my mum to come out with her until her husband got home. She told my mum what happened and they were both terrified. I asked my grandma about this and she told me the exact same thing. My grandma also told me that she'd seen large black figures in the home multiple times. I just got off the phone with my grandma to try and get everything as accurate as possible. She didn't have much time because she was at work, but she did tell me that a man hung himself in the basement and that she would see things in the kitchen a lot, like large black figures. The basement door was in the kitchen. She said that my mom would too, to the point that she would scream and cry multiple times from the ages of two and a half and told me that they moved out once when my mom was younger because of the weird stuff that was going on and someone else moved in for a while but they had to move back several years later, which was when she was grabbed from under the bed. She said something grabbed her by the ankle and shook the hell out of it. My great grandmother Emily owned the house the entire time, which is why they ended up back there. She also said that her son James had seen the red glowing eyes and all of the other kids would hear and see things constantly. But after things got physical with her and it grabbed her ankle, she got out of there for her own good. She also said that renters wouldn't stop moving out of the house very quickly until someone purchased it years later and it had been blessed. She thinks they're still living there to this day. When I was around 15, my mom told me about this again because it was so scary and interesting to me. I would have my mom retell me everything that happened in the house all the time and I ended up finding the house online while I was searching through articles to see if any information was available about it. I found that right down the street was Rosevare Park and Woods, and is said to be one of the most haunted places in Owasso. I'm not sure if it has any correlation with the house, but I just thought it was strange. In 2008, right after I graduated high school and moved away to college, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And in 2012, she unfortunately passed from the disease. Now my mum was a huge believer in the paranormal and swore her sister was a witch and always told me stories of how her mother and her found voodoo dolls and creepy stuff in her sister's room. They never got along and it always really upset my mum. She always said that if she doesn't care about her in life, then not to care about her in death. So when my mother died, and honestly being an ass, I didn't tell her sister or any of her sister's family. The first freaky part was when my mother was first diagnosed. As stated before, her sister did not call her once from my recollection, as they lived pretty far away. The day she was diagnosed, Apparently her sister called her out the blue to catch up and they went out for drinks, which made my mum feel better. I was told they did this about three times before abruptly ending it. I don't know the story since I was two states away at college at the time. In 2011, my mother's cancer was taking its toll. So I moved back home and enrolled in a local college to finish. As soon as I moved back home, I never felt right. It always seemed very ominous and since my mother was passing, I started suffering from anxiety and depression, so much that I dropped out of college and started to work full time, which was the worst mistake of my life. In May of 2012, my mother succumbed to her illness and passed away. While discussing the funeral, we were discussing who should come. Like I said before, 
I remember my mother telling me all the terrible stuff her sister put her through. And for me, a lifetime of wrong does not give forgiveness by trying to catch up four times and exiting out her life. So I barred her sister, never even telling her she'd passed. Her sister lived far away, and the obituary was only posted in the local paper. This is when stuff started to happen. Two weeks after the funeral, her sister called, like three years of no contact. She asked to speak with my mother, and I told her everything what happened and how my mum felt, and how she felt so hurt that her only sister ignored and abandoned her for 30 years. It got quite real on the phone. No one said anything until her sister hang up the phone in silence. Since then, I believe she's put a serious curse on me and my family. Two months after this incident, I was at my brother's house relaxing with him in the backyard. I got up to use the bathroom and went walking to the house and tripped in a random hole that seemed to just appear and broke my ankle severely in three different places requiring surgery. The recovery process for some reason took way longer and I lost my job over it. About a year later, healing, I struggled to find a place to hire me. Then to make matters worse, my father loses his job. To make matters even worse, he was diagnosed with cancer. I took every bit of savings that I had and took him to a hospital out of state. Thankfully, everything went well and he survived and everything felt peaceful while we were out of the house. When we got back, however, the endless bills and debt collectors arrived. I exhausted all my remaining funds for any type of decent future trying to save my house from being foreclosed. I had my car repossessed, sold almost all of my possessions. And through all of this, I tried to stay absolutely positive even though my world around me was collapsing. I was able to find work, but the struggles continued. But this only seemed to anger the curse even more. In 2016, while driving on the highway, of all places, with my father, our car suddenly shifted into neutral, making us almost get into a terrible accident with a semi. We took it to the garage while avoiding anything else, and took it toner. But even they had no idea what happened and couldn't fix it. When we did get a new car, it was riddled with and continues to be a money pit. Fast forward to 2017, my girlfriend thought I needed some time to relax and booked us a vacation to the Philippines to visit her family. While there, this black cloud seemed to follow me. We were in this hotel room getting ready to go out and my girlfriend decides to take a shower because of the heat. While she was in there, the glass shower door exploded on her. Glass from head to toe, scratches and blood. I rushed her to the hospital and while the glass barely missed her major veins, she ended up needing several stitches. We got back to the room only to have the cops show up because the hotel wanted me to pay $8,000 for a shower door. Her relatives worked for the media and somehow managed to get us out of this situation and flew us back right away. While home, my car insurance company somehow misplaced my payments and never told me cancelled my insurance and while driving to work a cop pulls me over and asks to see the usual paperwork he tells me to step out the car i asked why when another cop pulls up behind him comes to my door and tells me the same thing very confused why at what's happening he yanks the door open forcibly pulls me out throws me against my hood and yells stop resisting i'm now crying because i'm terrified and he continues to yell, why are you giving me attitude? The other cop pulls him off me, and I avoid getting arrested, but had my car towed for not having insurance. But that's just the start. After paying everything, getting my car back, just to find out my insurance company told the state, and the state canceled my car's registration. Apparently this is a huge crime, and a sheriff came to my door to arrest me if I didn't pay another $800. I depleted my savings again to appease everyone, only to live in fear without watching my back. In 2019, throughout the whole year again, strange stuff happened. Small stuff, like things disappearing and then reappearing a month later. Then around March, I break my toe. 
2019 ended not being the greatest year by having a huge fight with my girlfriend. So 2020, let's see what you've got. But seriously, I am cursed. I know this for a fact. I'm pretty sure my mum's sister was a witch. My friend and I had a long day filled to the brim with fun and adventure, joyous and whimsical things. After we had spent most of the day in the downtown portion of Charleston, enjoying the cool breeze, watching the rough waters roll against the docks, we decided it would be best to head back before nightfall. Some time had passed, and we eventually arrived back in our city of Somerville, but our appetite for the fun and excitement hadn't been sated yet, so we decided to drive around and look at a newer town that had been added close to us, the town of Summer's Corner. It was a nice town sure enough, but it felt off, unreal. It was heavy and almost suffocating, the feeling that was there, that wouldn't deter us, as we were quite the resilient bunch always moving forward, keeping a smile on our face, even if the circumstances are pure, unadulterated agony. About a half hour into the drive, we discovered a street called Navajo Boulevard, which had immediately interested us, as the name itself is similar to the Native American tribe of the Navajo people, just with a slight spelling differential. These Native Americans live in the southern United States, and are a great, proud people. They have many traditions with their tribes, with one such telling of a frightful creature. This creature is pure evil, a true monster among men. It is known as the Yenaldushi, and is a shape-shifting, vile, heart-wrenched fiend. We started to drive down the road, our windows rolled down so that we could enjoy that cool southern breeze. It's a dark, starry night, and while beautiful above us, the feeling from earlier was thicker and almost encumbering. Immediately I felt watched, not by the nightlife, which we noticed was eerily silent, but by something else. Whatever was watching us didn't want us there at all. It felt as though, whatever it was, was close to us. Its presence was intimidating and quite malicious, not to mention that it put us on edge. Our eyes peeled, and ourselves readied for whatever may happen next. What seemed like an hour or so had passed, when suddenly, where there had been no wind before, a heavy gust slammed itself against the car, nearly pushing it off the road and into the woods. Our hearts were about to beat out of our chests from the shock of it all, or at least mine was. Just then, as I tried to keep us on the road, we saw something pass by the car. It was grotesque, motted with malice and spiteful things. Its eyes, as pale as silver as the moon, gazed into our souls, sending nothing but fear throughout our bodies. We were motionless now, shrinking into our seats as this abomination grew closer. It unhinged its jaw and let out a horrific scream, snapping us back to reality. I put the car in gear, and we drove the hell out of there. Unfortunately, the feeling was intensified as we got back onto the road and sped away, another gust of wind slamming into the car. Suddenly, my friend had yelled for me to look out the window. Right behind my seatbelt on the outside of the car was that monster, and that's when I saw this awful thing in its entirety. It had reddish pale skin, and eyes that seemed to have no end, with goat and reptilian slits for pupils. The horns from atop its forehead gave it a demonic appearance, our fear intensifying beyond belief as a result. It unhinged its maw and revealed a row of sharp and twisted teeth. A hand with long claws stretched at the glass, making us scream to high heaven. As we were driving out of the neighborhood, going as fast as we could, the damned thing smiled at us and faded away. The breeze scattered the leaves on the road where it sauntered after it had jumped from my car. 
It was gone. But the feeling of fear that it left us with would haunt us for months to come. Norwich is an old medieval city in England, and has lots of beautiful and interesting old places to visit. One of its most famous buildings is the towering Norwich Cathedral, opposite Tomland, which sits down by the river Wensum. Anyhow, busy exploring my new city one Saturday, I visited the cathedral, and after wandering the building, decided to explore the cathedral close. It was late, a sunny afternoon in October, with lots of autumn leaves on the ground, and I was really enjoying my walk when I stumbled upon a cobbled alley, at the end of some houses, and decided to see where it led. The floor and walls were cobbled, and the walls maybe 10 foot high, so I couldn't see over them. But I could hear people in the gardens on the other side talking and children playing. Although I was on my own in the alleyway, I didn't feel alone. But as I began to walk on, the alley began to twist and turn, and although the sky was blue overhead, and the sun was still out, I began to feel increasingly uneasy. I could no longer hear voices coming from the other side of the walls, and when I thought about it, realised that in fact, I couldn't hear anything. No birds, no traffic, not even wind, and yet the cathedral is in the middle of a reasonably sized city. I began to feel nervous, and my scalp started to prick. And so I began to up my pace, telling myself that I'd been walking a while, and that the alleyway couldn't go on forever. But as I turned each blind bend, hoping to see the end of what was beginning to feel like a maze, I was only met with another stretch of alleyway. I began to jog, and although I hadn't seen anyone since entering the alleyway, and couldn't hear any footsteps on the cobbles behind me, I had the growing sensation that someone or something bad was following me close behind, and that the walls were pressing on. I started having difficulty breathing and realised I was also beginning to feel dizzy. I didn't want to pass out alone in this alleyway, and so decided to run. After what seemed like forever, I turned another corner and suddenly sprinted out onto a perfectly normal looking street down by the river, and the city sounds returned. I realised I was shaking, my hand and forehead dripping with sweat, and didn't have a clue where I was. I sat down on a wall and had a cigarette, and pulled myself together, and then stopped to pass a by and ask for directions back to the market square in the middle of town from where I could find my own way back to campus. It didn't take long to walk back to the market square, but when I checked my watch, it turned out that I had been in the alleyway for nearly an hour. It didn't make any sense, as I couldn't have walked that far, but I didn't want to know too much about it, and told myself that maybe it was all the twists and turns the alley had, and that added to the time. At class on Monday, I was telling a few people about the alleyway in the cathedral grounds, and how it had suddenly turned really spooky, when one of the mature students on our course, who had lived in Norwich for years, and knew a lot about its history overheard me. She asked me if the alley was an old cobbled one with high walls, that led off the cathedral close, and I said yes. She took me aside and quietly explained to me, that she wasn't surprised I'd felt what I did, because that was the alleyway they dragged people accused of witchcraft along, before burning them at the stake, as Norwich has a huge history of witches. But the kicker to this story, is that though I lived in Norwich for a number of years and often visited the cathedral, I never walked that alleyway again because of what happened, until that afternoon one day, when a friend from overseas was visiting. I took her down to the cathedral, and while there told her about the alleyway and what I'd experienced. She insisted that we walk it, and when I stalled and started to make excuses, promised me that if things started to go bad, we would just turn back, and she would stay with me at all times. Reluctantly, I agreed. The alley was just how I remembered it, at first. Dry cobbled floor and high cobbled walls backing onto people's gardens. But after ten minutes at most, and only a handful of turns, Suddenly, we found ourselves back onto the street. It didn't make any sense to me back then, and it still doesn't to this day. 
and I don't go near the witch's walk anymore. I was raised Catholic, and became an atheist around when I started middle school. I did not come out to my parents about being an atheist, until I was well into college. So I spent my teenage years pretending to be Catholic. Several times when I was a kid, I would get a bad premonition feeling in the middle of the night, that were basically panic attacks. I was certain that I was going to die or that something bad was about to happen. When I told my mum about these, she would encourage me to pray until the feeling went away. So one night in high school, I wake up with this feeling again. I feel like there's something watching me, even though my bedroom is well lit by a nearby streetlight, and there's nothing there. Whenever I hear someone say that they felt a presence, I think of this moment. My senses give me no indication that there was anyone around, but I was certain that there was, despite all evidence to the contrary. I thought that they must be darting in and out of my vision faster than I could blink, or that they had managed to get under my bed somehow without opening the closed and locked window and door to my room. After laying in bed, panicked for what felt like hours, my sister calls out to me from her room across the hall. She had heard a voice and thought slash hoped it was me, but it wasn't. I lied and said it was so that she wouldn't be scared. We both got out of bed and went to get my mother. She saw the look on my face and got out her Bible and sat us all down in the living room. I panicked even more because I had no faith in what she was about to do would be helpful. I don't know where I heard it, but I remember someone once saying something about there being loads of people who didn't believe in God, but they believe in the devil. I didn't believe that my mum's praying was going to help, but I did believe that whatever I was feeling was evil with a capital E. My sister, who was a year younger than me, started to cry after our second our father. She was, and still is, fiercely religious. And this was the first time that she had ever experienced the middle of the night dread, the way that I had when I was a kid. Even though I didn't believe the words, I said them anyway. Now that I'm in graduate school to be a mental health counsellor, I can in retrospect say that repeating a mantra of familiar words that were once comforting and reassuring would naturally help calm someone in my state. However, I didn't feel calmer as we continued to pray. I only felt increasingly anxious that something awful was about to happen. I noticed my mother getting louder and louder with every word, and I couldn't tell if she was angry, scared, or both. I followed suit and became louder, but the presence didn't go away. Without any warning, there was a loud bang, like a gunshot, and the floor shook as though it had happened right next to us. I distinctly remember facing the heavy glass door to the patio and seeing it vibrate. We were all stunned into silence. As a kid, nothing was scarier than seeing my parents scared and the look of wide eyed terror on my mother's face at that moment is burned into my brain. Pretty much immediately, the panic I felt subsided. My mother stood up and walked into the patio door to look outside. Then she looked at the clock. It was 3am. My father slept throughout all of this, without even stirring, and could not believe that the house shook so much without waking him. To this day, my mother is positive that we banished a demonic presence from the house. I myself have no idea what happened, but I know that I felt in my heart that I was doomed, and I felt the house shake in a way that I still cannot explain away rationally. I lived in the RGV, living in Edinburgh, but grew up in Rio Grande City my entire life. My grandma told me stories of her encounters 
with the Lechuza when I was a kid. I was usually skeptical of mystical tales, but when it came to my grandmother, I bought her stories. It wasn't until I had my own experience that I was fully invested in other old wives' tales and folklore. I was out at a friend's ranch north of Rio Grande City with my buddy and a cousin of mine, a mutual friend and my buddy's dad. We were putting up some fence posts and barbed wire so we can corral some stray cattle that had wandered onto the property and keep them there until we found the owner. The sun was setting, so we decided to call it a day. We built a bonfire close by and huddled up in an unfinished ranch hand's house, basically a concrete slab surrounded by four walls and no roof. We were drinking and just shooting the breeze and telling stories from high school when eventually, we got to stories of the paranormal. My buddy is a huge skeptic, mostly because he's afraid of it. So he kept trying to steer the conversation away from ghosts and such. I decided to share a lechuza story my grandmother told me. Once I got to describing the creature, we heard an ungodly screech, almost ear piercing. We all turned to look in the direction of the screech, and before my eyes can adjust to the darkness, I hear my buddy screaming that it's a lechuza, and he hauls ass to the main ranch house a few hundred yards away. I turn back to the darkness, and see a giant silhouette of an owl perched on one of the posts we had driven earlier in the day. It was massive, so naturally I did one of the two things they tell you never to do. I whistled at it. This thing screeched again and spread out its wings. Its wingspan had to be in at least seven feet in each direction, so 14 feet. The fence posts were spaced about 16 feet apart and its wings almost spanned half the distance. Scared out of my mind, I pumped my chubby tree trunk thighs as hard as I could and ran. As I had the back door to the ranch house in view, I got to see my buddy run in and close the door behind him. My cousin and our friend got their moments later too, and I hadn't noticed they took off right after my buddy, and were kicking and pounding on the door nearly in tears. I get about halfway there and look back to the unfinished house and see the gigantic bird perched up on one of the walls, its face catching the moonlight as it cocks its head sideways, kind of how a dog does when they hear the owner make a strange sound. In the mere moment of its face being lit up, I swear I was able to make out human-like features with a bonfire lighting up the area behind it. I finally reach the ranch house and my buddy's dad opens the door and we're almost in tears. I rush in, close the door behind me, and my buddy's dad demands to know what's going on. Trying to catch my breath, I tell him with the others adding their points of view as well. We all look out the back door to see if it's still there and just try to convince ourselves that we saw a regular owl, and my buddy's dad called us some rude names between chuckles. We scanned the horizon, and I'm armed with a baseball bat I found at the back door, my buddy with his firearm, and there's no bird. We got back with flashlights, me, my bat, my cousin, and a few weapons. We got back with our equipment, and our friend stayed back at the ranch house, he was done for the night. We get back to the bonfire to snuff it out. Smokey the bear was always kind of an influence on me, and we investigate the surrounding area. My buddy's dad breaks off from the group to check out the fence post to make sure they're undisturbed while we just hang back to think what happened. After a bit, we go join my buddy's dad and find him standing in front of the post we had originally seen the lechos are perched on. We never told him which one specifically, so I was kind of surprised to see him at the one. And then we saw the claw marks. Yesterday, I walked into a witch store with my friend. She was genuinely curious and practiced witchcraft. I didn't mind at all. I found it interesting to say the least. As she was looking for candles, I was exploring the store. The walls were painted black, with only lights dimly lit in the store. There was a section in the back where dead animals were encased in glass jars being sold. It sent chills up my spine and gave me goosebumps. 
About five minutes later, I noticed that my body felt cold. It was a warm sunny day in the city. Why was I freezing? And then it felt as if something slipped into my body. It was subtle. And after a few thoughts of wondering and confusion, I forgot all about it. A few hours later at home, I felt pretty tired. It was probably just exhaustion because it was a fun day walking around the city. However, I for some reason wanted to sleep early. It was 6pm. I could tell something was off, but I pushed it aside and tried to get back to sleep. I somehow couldn't. I kept tossing and turning. Suddenly I was starving. I got out of bed and asked my mum if there was anything to eat. I ate, but couldn't chew normally. Everything seemed out of place. When I walked around, everything was in slow motion. I felt dizzy and fell to my knees. I quickly picked myself up and rushed back into bed. A few minutes later, I got up again, but this time the feeling I had was like the urge to vomit, but nothing came out. After many attempts, I had pain in my lower abdomen. It didn't feel like period cramps. It was so painful that I passed out. The next thing I knew, I awoke to see a needle in my arm connected to a tube leading to an IV. I was in the hospital. The doctor said I was fine, nothing was wrong with my body. I also do feel fine. Right now, I'm currently sharing this and don't feel different or sick. Was there an evil spirit in that witch store that entered my body? If there was, I hope it doesn't choose to return. Three years ago, my daughter attempted suicide and ended up in CICU for six days and inpatient directly after for five days. When she came home, unexplainable things started happening. We had lived here for 11 years and prior to this, nothing had ever happened. We were finding animals that had been dead a very long time on our back porch steps. Two carcasses to be exact. A knife flew off our kitchen counter while no one was in the room. We even put the knife back on the counter and jumped to see if it would rattle off. It didn't move. My daughter confided in me that she felt a demon followed her from the hospital. She would sleep at night with headphones so she wouldn't hear the demon telling her things. I did call a local paranormal research team out to the house and they found a spirit named Adam and a dark entity. They wanted to come back after they went through all the evidence, but my husband said no. The scariest thing that has happened to me in our house was when I was in bed and I felt like something was there. I opened my eyes just to appease my senses, not really thinking anything was there. And a very large, very tall, completely black figure was at the end of my bed. When I realized that half of the TV screen was blocked by this figure, I screamed and covered my head up. When I looked again, I just saw the TV and the dresser as normal. My daughter has been in and out of several facilities since the first attempt, six times in fact, and is a shard of the girl I knew and raised. I used to be fit and cared about my body, but I don't anymore. I have feelings of my own every day about taking my own life, but it's like they aren't mine if that makes sense. I'm not suicidal, but somehow my mind thinks that I need to perish. It's so hard to explain, and sometimes I wonder if I'm feeling my daughter's thoughts. The most consistent physical thing in our house that happens is light bulbs exploding or blinking. I was using the bathroom and two light bulbs exploded and glass went everywhere. It was so loud and so much that glass went all the way into our bathtub. Our living room lights explode frequently, but never two at a time. Are we just going through a rough time in life or is there something more sinister going on? This is no joke. It is very real to us and I don't know what to do about it. Any thoughts or opinions would be incredibly appreciated. This takes place 
in La Pateca, which is a rural area just south of Monterrey in Mexico. When I was a little girl, we always had legends of the witches in the wild. Don't go out alone, don't stay out so late at night. If you do, the witches will come and take you away, my mama would tell me and my brother Armando every day. Mama would not let me or Armando go anywhere, unless it was both of us, and the furthest we could go was the little store a mile away, when we needed groceries. We were not well off with money, so we had to walk everywhere. When Armando and I got done working the fields, Mama would let us play until it was night time. Sometimes we would play tag with our friends, sometimes Papa would chase us around or take us exploring in the woods. The exploring was fun, because we got to see animals, but we also saw the little old huts where the witches lived. Everyone called them the witches, because they were weird, and would constantly do black magic and talk to themselves. One day, Armando and I were playing alone, because Papa was tired from working on the field all day, and Mama was making supper. We went to the woods, and started to explore, but we went too deep and got lost. I cried and cried because I wanted Mama, but nobody heard us so we kept walking around. After a little bit, an old lady heard us and said she would help us. No, you're a witch, and you're gonna take us away, yelled Armando. No, no, mijo. I know where your mummy and papi are, she said. I cried and told Armando that I wanted to go home. So he gave up and told the lady to help us. Okay, follow me. After a while, she took us to a house we didn't know, but said mama and papa were inside, so we went. Without thinking, we went in, and the lady suddenly grabs us and starts carrying us, screaming into another room. She threw us in and locked the door. Armando kept banging on it and yelling to let us go, and I just cried and cried. It was quite quiet, but I thought I kept heard her saying, Glory to God. He has given me pure blood of the innocent. With this, I'm going to seek my revenge against those who have done things to me in the past. I don't exactly remember how much time passed, because I was tired after crying for so long. According to Papa, we were not home, so he went around town looking for us until he came into the woods to look. He said he stopped at the house where we were at because something made him look there. When Papa called out to the house inside, the witch kept yelling at him to go away, but he said he thought he heard Armando, so he broke in to look around. He found us and said he heard banging, which showed him where we were. When he found us, he hugged us and took us away, telling her that if he ever saw her near the house again, or the kids, he would end her. Mama was crying so hard when we saw her, that it made me cry again. Papa yelled at us for being dumb and going out so far, and Armando just looked at the floor. After that, Mama didn't let us go out anymore without her or Papa until we were teenagers. Every day I thank God for not letting me and Armando get into more danger that day. I do not know what the witch wanted to do to us, but I don't think I want to know, either. This happened in Manitou Springs. My wife and I at the time had a long commute between work and our home. We drove to the city in the daytime, came to our apartment in the evening. We had our youngest daughter at the time, and were unloading some groceries. My wife saw from the corner of her eye a figure approaching. It was bizarre for her to get defensive, since many tourists walked the roads we lived on, Rutan Avenue. She took our daughter inside right away, fearing something amiss. She came back out to help me and told me she felt weak all of a sudden, and started pointing at this lady walking up the hill. She noticed the person did not look like someone she wanted to be in the presence of, and fled inside immediately after seeing what they looked like. I, however, stayed, not knowing what I could make eye contact with. She looked homeless, which was common, as a lot of people come to Colorado for the pot craze. 
This was different. She had a burlap sack cut in sections that almost had a weird aura, almost a memorization of confusion. Her face was scarred and deformed. She looked like she had a humpback, but possibly could have been carrying supplies. I made eye contact for the briefest moment, almost feeling an energy pushing me away. She had a staff too, and was walking very slow. I got chills, turned to grab the last of the bags, and as soon as I did, she was gone. I knew she would be there, and my curiosity struck me to see what this entity was. But she vanished, poofed into nowhere, one way street with a river next to the road. I later went out to enjoy a cigarette that very night. It was two or three in the morning, very late, super dark, and no lights on the street. It was a hill. So I looked up the road and noticed up in the pass in the faint distance, I could see colors changing, almost like a flame burning, but not the same colors. It was more purple, blue and black. I still do not know to this day what this thing was. If it was a trick, it was well played. But the street had a very dark history. No doubt in my mind, this thing could have been a witch or demon of some sort. I have relatives in Mexico that live in the rancho. It's a small town sort of village, not third world, but very humble. Since I was a child, we would visit every winter while my dad was on break from his job on the farm. It was great. Lots of fun playing with my cousins, not having a care in the world. At night, the whole place is just overly creepy. Everyone has a story of experiencing something paranormal, including my family. Every corner has a story of something that appears or happens. So while I spent many nights scared out of my mind, thankfully, nothing ever happened to me until about three years ago. I'm 29. I hadn't visited in a while since I was now an adult with a job and responsibilities. The place is pretty much the same. And the nights are just how I remembered them. Only now, obviously, instead of playing games, I'd go out and have drinks with friends and the typical adult fun. Honestly, it helped with the sleeping. I'd come home drunk and sort of just pass out without too much trouble. The nights I didn't go out and drink. The nights I didn't go out and drink were still creepy. But I'd still managed to fall asleep without too much difficulty. One night I arrived home at around 1230 at night with my uncle and cousin. We had taken my cousin's young baby to the hospital to get checked. So we're all very tired and head our separate ways off to bed. My uncle's house shares the lot with my grandma's house, and all that separates them is the patio that is shared. I head to the room I stayed in with my cousin, who was still awake watching TV. I get comfy and fall asleep almost immediately. I start dreaming, and I'm hearing this very loud sound. In my dream, it appears to be a large bull, just breathing fast and heavy. But I slowly start waking up, and I'm still hearing the noise. I glance across the room, and I can see my cousin by the lights of the TV, and his eyes are wide open. He looks terrified. The sound is coming right outside our door. Like I said, I had been asleep, so I wasn't fully awake and processing everything. So I just loudly said, what the hell is that? And the sound stops. With that, I just lay my head back down and try going back to sleep. But it must have finally all registered with me, because I woke up and asked my cousin if he had heard the sound too. He still looks scared out of his mind and nods, yes. I decide to take a peek out the window, but it's pitch black out and I can't see a thing. I contemplated going outside, but honestly just chickened out. So morning comes and I go outside. No sign of really anything strange. My aunt's in the kitchen and preparing breakfast as normal. That's when my cousin and his wife come over and ask if I had heard anything last night. 
I said it sounded like something was coming from outside our door. And they had heard it too, coming from the same direction, as that's when I noticed a broom leaning against a wall. And that's when it hit me. It wasn't hearing an animal. What I heard was the sound of a broom being swept incredibly fast. I know it sounds like a cliche fairy tale stuff with the broom, but the town is known for many women who are believed to be witches and practice all sorts of dark arts. I know many people would just say that it's probably a regular person trying to scare us. But as with every house in Mexico, our place is very well barricaded. So unless someone could climb up flat walls, I don't see how any normal person could just come in and leave without making a sound going up our walls and our steel fence. Thankfully, the rest of my stay was uneventful, but I do regret not being awake enough to look outside when I heard it. I don't know what I would have seen, and I don't know if I want to know, but I'd rather not wait for it to happen again to answer those questions. This happened to my uncle's wife. I will narrate it how she did to me and my sisters. We're from the northern state of Mexico, Nuevo Leon, from a small town south of Monterrey around El Cierro de la Silla. If you've never heard of it, do Google it, it's beautiful. Stories about people seeing witches and lechuzas around the town are very common, but my aunt's story really pulls a chill down my spine. The story goes like this. I lived in a small home up in the hills. I shared a room with my sister, our windows facing the main street. It was big, and it had rails on the window. One night, me and my sister were in bed. She was asleep, and I was awake, lying on my bed, looking outside my window, since my bed was against the wall and right underneath the window. I liked opening the window and looking up at the sky. I remembered being around 3am, when I decided that I had to get some rest. I stood up just to close my window, and that's when I saw her, the witch, flying right in front of my house. She saw me, and we made eye contact, and I immediately shut my window and got under my covers and started praying. I eventually fell asleep, and awoke to the fresh air hitting my face as I opened my eyes and I see my head sticking out the window. I scream as loud as I could, and my sister woke up to help me. I'd never been afraid like I had been at that moment in all my life, as I realized that it was only her power that caused me to look out my window like that. If it wasn't for the rails, she would have had me. My aunt told us that her grandma would tell that the witches would take kids out their windows at night and she never believed her until it happened to her. She believed the witch wanted revenge because my aunt made eye contact with her. The crazy part is that until this day, she sometimes wakes up with random bruises or hickey marks on her skin. Well, that's her story. This happened when I was about four or five. Among my siblings and cousins, we always said that my grandma's house was haunted. You could hear footsteps and whispers at night, and the back room would always be colder and would get a heavy oppressive feeling. So one day, all of the older kids went to hang out, and my parents took my grandma to run errands, so it was only me and my aunt and uncle at home. They were cleaning the backyard, and I was playing with toys in the dirt. For whichever reason, I can't remember, I went inside and went into the back room, which was my grandma's at the time. As I stood there, I remember that heavy feeling starting to creep in. There was a big window that I looked out into the backyard, and I decided to go to it. As I moved the curtain, I could see this really old trailer that sat in the backyard that was used for storage. The doorway would have only been about five feet from the window. As I looked out, I immediately noticed a figure in the doorway of the trailer. It filled most of the doorway. It was dressed in a long black dress with like a turtleneck, the dress being super black. 
I don't think I've ever seen such a pure black in my life. It had a bald, round wrinkly head, with tall pointy ears. Think of the goblins from Harry Potter, and the hands ended in long sharp talons. All the skin of this thing was really sickly, this shade of green, and it just stood in the trailer staring back at me. Then it began to shake its head and index finger, as if to say, no, like you'd tell a little kid. After that, it slid out of view, and the heavy feeling lifted. I don't recall what I did after that, but I don't remember feeling scared, more confused, I would say. I had forgotten about the event until years and years passed, when the siblings were sitting around reminiscing after my grandma passed, and my sister said she remembered seeing something similar. She said she also saw a woman in a long red dress and a pumpkin for a head, sitting by the water fountain or bird bath. The house isn't in the family anymore, so I can't say that something else happened, but we all suspect that there was a witch residing in or around grandma's house. I've never shared this before, and I'm not sure where to begin. But I feel that I need to relay this story in a public place, in case that something happens to me. I have left information as a precaution that my brother may find if I were to go missing. Honestly, I am really perplexed by this whole thing, as I consider myself a big skeptic of many things like this, and I tried to write this meeting I had off with this very strange person about 12 years ago. Because of something else that has happened a few days ago, which I believe to be related to this guy, I feel the need to revisit the possibility of this being more than just an oddity. To put into perspective why I believe this man was related to what happened to me recently, I need to explain a bit about my background, and the first time I believed I encountered things associated with this guy. I am Southern, and almost 30 now. The incident related to this man, who I'll call the rancher, happened when I was 18, working my first real job. It was the fall of 2007 when I met this guy, but I believe I may have come into contact with these things which I now heavily associate with him when I was 10 years old. I lived in Tennessee for the first part of my childhood. There is a very small town outside of Knoxville, a couple of hours away where my grandfather had a farm. We'd visit semi-regularly, and I would go and see the cows and chickens he had raised. We would sometimes pay him for meat, when he was going to slaughter one of the cows, and freeze it for meals for months. They also had corn and other crops there that he would harvest. His main source of income, though, was a retirement from the military, and he had several sheds and workshops where he would fix discarded appliances and vehicles and sell them. The first incident in question was during the summer of 1998 on his farm. I was actually out playing with one of their border collies while my granddad was out in the field feeding the cattle. The farm is in the hills, as this area is part of the Smoky Mountains, and the farm was quite large. I don't know how large off the top of my head, but large enough that it had big fields and a smaller area for crops, and his property encompassed a very large portion of the surrounding wooded area. Me and the dog, whose name was Sweetie, wandered up into the wooded area a bit during the times he was feeding the cattle. I was alone except for Sweetie when this occurred, and I was so young at the time that the memory was, and still is to some extent, a bit fuzzy. But the important part is still very clear. During this particular excursion into the woods, me and Sweetie came across what I can only describe as a large tree, with a hole beneath it. As we came up onto the hole, I looked down into it, and I couldn't see the bottom, and it was pitch black. 
For the longest time, I thought that this was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But I believe what I saw then was real now. My head started almost buzzing, and I felt my hair stand on end. I started shaking, but I couldn't look away from it. I felt like if I started to run, I would die. It's really hard to describe the sensation, but I would call it an impending sense of dread. There were eyes looking back at me from this hole, but I couldn't see the body at first. Then I saw what looked like a smile, and a very small body of this humanoid thing. Its body was entirely black, like freshly laid asphalt. It was unnaturally black. I mean it was like looking into the absence of light. The only light portions were the eyes, and eventually the mouth. It kind of smiled at me, and I felt like I was going to die looking at it. But I couldn't run away. After that, it's like I can't remember exactly what happened at my next memory. It was me, walking back for dinner. I should also tell you that we could not find Sweetie after that, and I felt so bad because I really loved that dog. I didn't tell anyone what I saw. I didn't want them to think that I were crazy or demonically possessed or something, as my family is very religious. And I'm not anymore since my teens, but I was raised a very fundamentalist Christian as a young boy. So I was very much convinced that Satan and demons were real. And over time, this memory kind of faded and I ended up thinking I either dreamt it or simply remembered it wrong. Fast forward to 2007. I was 18, almost 19, and it was the fall of the year. I was working at my first real job while attending college for computer science. Keep this in mind that this time I was totally irreligious. I didn't believe in anything supernatural, extraterrestrial, or anything remotely paranormal. I was an avid reader of prominent atheists such as Richard Dawkins. My job was at a bookstore. It was a chain of bookstores which I think are mostly regional to the south. At this point we had moved to Alabama, and had been living in that state for almost nine years. I had actually just gotten a promotion to work at the store's joint coffee shop as a barista. But I also still sometimes worked at the register or did stocking. The first time I encountered this man that I will refer to as the rancher, I was actually working the front cash register. I often worked the late night shift there, which was from 4 till 12. We would start closing at around 11.30, though I did most of that by myself, as it was usually just me and one of the assistant managers and a barista for the coffee shop there that late. It was around 11pm, and this guy comes in, and I immediately got this strange feeling about this guy. The reason I'll call this guy the rancher, is that he was dressed like a cowboy, straight out of a western film or even a rodeo. I had family in Texas, so I had been to rodeos before, and I mean this guy was just very strange to be walking in a bookstore at 11pm, decked out in snakeskin cowboy boots, a cowboy hat, and western-looking clothes. I thought at first he was just a tourist or something, and went back to reading. I read books in the evening, because we didn't get a lot of people buying books that late. We mostly stayed open, because there were loads of groups that liked our coffee shop, and I guess they made money off it being open in the evenings. This guy walked to the back at some point for a good 20 minutes. Then I was about to make a closing announcement, as I usually do at 11.30, and he came up to the counter with four books. I thought the selection was a very strange mix of material. One of them was a physics book, one of them an automotive manual, one of them something on New Age religion, and the other was about martial arts. I honestly don't remember the specific book titles, because what really stuck out about the event was the guy. I could barely look away from him while I was helping him check out. 
I started getting this feeling that something about this guy's body was fake. His skin was extremely pale, but not that out of the realm of possibility, but very unusual. He was the whitest man I've ever seen, without being an obvious albino or something. But the other thing were his eyes. They were beady. They almost looked like glass eyeballs. Maybe like he was wearing contacts. But it was really hard to tell exactly why they looked that way. He smiled at me as well for the entire time. And it was more than just a friendly grin. It was almost like a sexual flirtation or something. At the end, when I had just finished rigging him up and bagging his books, I realised he hadn't said anything to me. And I had been making my usual niceties, which I like to think of as customer service. But at the end, he stopped for a minute and stared at me before leaving and asked, What did you say your name was? I thought this was really bizarre at the time. Because one, I had a name tag on, and two, I never told him my name during the entirety of the conversation. But for some reason though, he acted as though I did tell him, and he had just forgotten. I told him what my name was, and he was like, Oh, that's a nice name. I'll have to ask for you if I return here. At this point, I just thought this guy was hitting on me or something. He was really creepy and I just wanted him to leave as soon as possible. Thankfully, he did. Unfortunately, I would see him one more time after about three weeks. It was late again, a little after 10pm, and this time I was actually working in the coffee shop. I was making coffee drinks for a group of students that came in to do a study group or club or something like that. They did come pretty often. And while I turned around to start giving them their orders, I realised the rancher guy was back there behind them. He was in the same cowboy-like attire. And he was standing there very still, looking in my direction with that same weird smile. It almost seemed forced. I felt this weird sense of dread, and I was reminded of the memory from my childhood, because it was the only other time I had ever felt that type of sensation before. The students left, and he came up and ordered, and he said he wanted a bottle of milk from our mini-fridge. I got it for him and he paid. I watched as he stood there and opened it and started drinking it. Then he paused and said, Hmm, it's good, but missing something. He drank half the bottle, and I watched him go over to our cafe area, where we had creamer sitting out for people's coffee. He proceeded to pour creamer into the bottle until it was nearly full again and then resumed drinking the drink and the entire thing in one continuous gulp without breathing. He left to go into the store where the book racks are after that. I was hoping he had left by the time I took my evening break not long after and made myself a drink and went to sit by one of the tables on our adjoined patio area. This was at 11pm, because I always took my evening break then, when I worked in the coffee shop. I was sitting there reading my book, and trying to enjoy my drink after that unnerving experience. And then I heard our patio door open, and it was the rancher guy again. I realised I was cornered, and he sat down at my table directly across from me, he sat there motionless, but had this weird smile, and he took off his hat and put it on the table. That's when I realised this guy was also bald, and his scalp looked very strange, like it had never had hair at all. It almost looked like rubber. It was very odd. And I asked if I could help him find something, thinking maybe he was just being creepy and trying to hit on me again or something. He said my name rather calmly, and then the conversation got very strange and specific. He said, I'm actually here because you are one of my tasked individuals. I don't know why you're on my list for this area, but you are. And I like you, so I'm going to be frank with you. I'm not entirely human. 
He paused at this point, and I had that feeling of dread again, even more than before, and I was like crawling out of my skin at this point. I actually panicked and got up, and as I did, he said my address, and I froze and realised that this guy knew where I lived, and who I was or something. Sit down, he said. You're making this difficult. I'm not going to hurt you. That's not my job. My job is to simply keep track of individuals I've been tasked with. That's all. And I need to ask you a few questions, to make sure there aren't going to be any problems. He started smiling again. And it was like a forced smile. It looked fake, and he looked so strange, but I sat down because this guy had threatened me. And he knew where I lived. And I didn't know what else to do other than to see what he wanted. And maybe get more info on him, so that I could tell the police after he left. I'm actually from a certain organisation that manages many things here on this planet. And am what you would call a liaison between your kind and them. I am partially them, but mostly one of you. And I am tasked with direct, prolonged communications with your type. He proceeded to ask me some questions about whether or not I had ever seen anything out of the ordinary, and who I might have told about it. Obviously he meant other than him, because I remarked he's freaking me out, and asked if this was some kind of prank. I finally told him about my memory from when I was a kid, and told him that I hadn't told anyone about it. He remarked that that would likely be the reason I was on his list. He also asked me a few other questions seemingly unrelated. He asked me what I was studying in school, and where I thought I might work after I graduated. He seemed fairly interested if I was considering becoming a military contractor and also asked about some of my family members' military service. In between each question, he would pause for a good 20 to 30 seconds. I asked him what he was doing after the third time this happened, and he said he was scanning my possible timelines for confirmation. He told me his kind could actually see different spectrums than us, and he was having this conversation with multiple versions of myself. He was making sure none of them were going to become problematic for him, because he hated having to return. After several questions, he gave me that smile that said all done. He got up and said, people weren't likely to believe me, but that I should not talk to them about the small black creatures I encountered, or I could meet with someone else from his organisation with a different designation, and it may not end as nicely for me. After this, I didn't see the rancher guy again, and I tried to forget the event as best I could. I actually went to therapy for this, and didn't give the therapist specific details about this encounter. She helped me greatly, as I was able to finish school. I work as a software engineer now, and have not had any strange occurrences for 12 years. This year, I adopted a dashant puppy. He's very sweet. He's about seven months old now, and we like to play outside in the afternoons. A couple of days ago, I was on my porch relaxing, when I heard him growling. I have never heard him growl before at anything. He's barked before, but never growled. I rushed over to see what was wrong, because I thought maybe he found a wild animal or something. He was growling at the gap beneath my wooden deck. I looked under there, moving him to the side, and I saw a small dark figure and eyes. I grabbed my pup, and ran back upstairs, and inside locked all of the doors. I'm very upset and anxious over this, and have been losing a lot of sleep. I had an exterminator come out, and he said he couldn't find anything even after I begged him to look under the whole area twice and told him I thought maybe mice or something were under my deck. He found nothing. I am extremely afraid that I might be visited by that bizarre man, or someone associated with him. And if for some reason I go missing, 
I have set an automated delivery message to go to my brother, if I am absent for more than a month. Godspeed. I hope none of you have ever encountered this guy, or any of his people. When my grandma was very sick, my parents decided to move closer to her in order to help treat her and make sure that she was comfortable during her final days. However, her final days seemed to drag on a bit longer than we'd all anticipated. And seeing that she was going to live for longer than we thought, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, my parents decided to sell their old house and to live in hers. Her house was very large. It was the house that my father had grown up in, and it had been standing strong for at least 150 years. This was in rural England, and me and my parents liked the change of scenery and change of pace. However, there was something that always creeped me out, the basement. I never liked going down there. I never had any reason to. It was a very small, dark room and didn't really have stairs, as they were rotting and old, and you had to be very careful as you treaded down if there was something that you needed to retrieve. For the most part, it was mostly used to store wine. That's what my grandma used it for anyway. I think it appeared to be more of an afterthought, as it was bricked up, but it was damp, and you could smell the earth around you. I never felt comfortable. However, as we moved in, my parents needed a place to store some old boxes, and so that's where they put them. It was on a typical Sunday that I was bored, and my dad told me to go find one of his power tools, as he was trying to fix one of the door hinges. When asking where it was, he told me that it was in the basement in one of the boxes. I really didn't want to go, and asked if my sister could go in my place. But she being six years old, he really didn't trust her with any of these tools. So, down I went, into the darkness in search for these tools. I turned on the light, which barely illuminated the small space, and started digging around the boxes for the tools. That's when something caught my eye. Something reflecting off one of the stones. I pushed the light, which was dangling from a wire, a little bit closer, to see if I could check out what this thing was. The sparkle had me excited. Money? Could it be money here? I couldn't see it well enough though. The illumination was too poor. So I quickly found my dad's power tool and told myself that I would be back to try and see what this mystery could hold. Upon returning a few minutes later with a decent torch, the light showed that it was indeed something metal. I tried pulling at it, to no avail. I was starting to pull at it, with no avail. Clearly, whatever it was, was sealed solidly into the wall. And that was it. I couldn't get to it, and I forgot all about it. Then a few years passed. I had grown up a fair amount. I was now 17, and my grandma at this point had passed away. But we ended up inheriting the house, and after paying off the tax, we were living there very happily. Me, my sister, my mother, and my father. It had taken some time to get used to the new environment, but this was now our home. One year, we had some particularly bad floods, and the basement flooded. Everything there was ruined, and 17-year-old me had the task of getting rid of everything that had been soaked. We managed to get all the water out, and we were considering just sealing it up. As we were debating this, I went down and made sure that I retrieved everything so that it could all be disposed and to check on the off chance that anything was salvageable. I wasn't sure about the wine. 
My dad couldn't tell if water had gone in or not, so sadly all of that had to be disposed of. But that's when I saw it again. The shiny thing in the wall. I hadn't been back here in a long time. I hated the basement, so I had no reason to. And that's when I wondered if this time I could pull it. So, with everything being so wet, and apparently the cement being weakened, I gave it a tug, and stronger 17-year-old me felt some movement. This caused genuine excitement. I started pulling it, and it became very clear that it was behind the brickwork. I started playing around, and after retrieving a knife from the kitchen, it was very, almost too easy to start taking the bricks apart by chipping away at the old cement. That is when I found it. Hidden behind here was a box, a metal tin. It was sealed, and sealed very well, might I add. When I managed to finally take the lid off, that I discovered what was hidden inside. An old Ouija board, as well as a few coins, notes, a die, and a few other bits and bobs. These must have been games. But why would anyone put games in a tin and bury them behind a wall in the basement? This left me very confused, but I was happy with my loot. Now bear in mind, me and my family were never raised religious, and I in no way believed in anything supernatural. These were just games. I mean, you had some classics there on paper, but the board was made out of solid wood. It was sturdy and looked the real deal. You could tell how old it was. So I invited my friends over a few days later to muck around with it. Fortunately for me, it was one of the days where my dad had to take my sister to a dance competition. And my mother, being the supportive mother she was, went with them, which left me and the house alone. It was your typical Friday evening. I invited the boys round, and we decided to have a go on the Ouija board. We tried to just muck around at first, pretending to be all spooky and creepy. We fetched a glass from the kitchen, put our fingers on it, and started saying, in a creepy and almost mocking tone, If anyone's there, we invite you, woo! Like that. Silly, I know. I'm sure we must have offended something. We waited to see if there was any movement, but there was nothing. When we were about to give up, though, did movement start slowly coming through. Each of us, of course, thought that it was one of our friends, making the glass move. But alas, we all denied it. One of the friends was writing everything down. And towards the end, we had a friend writing everything down. And whilst playing our Q&A, we established that we were talking to Sam. And Sam was not very happy. He just said no to most of our questions. We really weren't understanding it. We asked him, where he died, and he just said no. We asked him if he was dead, and he just said no. And we asked him if he would like to continue talking to us, and only then did he say yes. We tried asking him how old he was, but there'd never be a reply. We were a bit creeped out by now, although I personally believed it was definitely Barry. Barry was always a joker. So the session concluded without much information. We weren't really happy and moved on to a different game. Bear in mind, we never said hello and we never said goodbye. So I'm not really sure how that works. Apparently it means we left the session open and I think that was our mistake. The rest of that night was uneventful. But when I went to bed that evening, I had this heavy, an oppressing feeling that was covering all my body. I tried to go to sleep, but felt really uncomfortable, and resorted to turning the light on in order to sleep all night. It gave me the comfort I needed to wake up happy in the morning, 
but it was still there. It felt like something was wrong. I tried telling myself I was just creeped out, that I was playing with the silly board and that it was getting to me, and that I should just move on. The feeling didn't go away, but as long as I remember, I tried putting it to the back of my mind. A few weeks later, I told myself that it had to do with the board and put it up on eBay as an authentic Ouija board, which I thought could fetch a pretty penny, but only managed to get me about 25 pounds. Eh, not that bad. I was just glad to be rid of it, to be fair. But the feeling never went away. That's when the apparition started. I started seeing a shadow, some kind of weird smoke creature, standing at the foot of my bed at night. I'd be unable to move, and it would just be there staring at me. There'd be times when I would come into my room in the middle of the night, and look in and turn the light on. And in that split second before the light went on, would I see the creature of shadow in a corner of the room, or on the ceiling. But the moment the light switch flicked on, it would be gone. I was scared that I was going insane that my mind was being consumed by this primal fear of that stupid board. But I tried to be stronger than it. The apparitions didn't cease though. Nay, they started to become more commonplace. I started losing sleep. And when I was dozing off at school, just at the point before I knew that I was going to pass out, did I see it? It was right by my teacher. This black, grey, smoke, thing. This figure, just looming around, haunting me. I didn't know what to do. There was a girl in my class who was really into Wicca, and I tried telling her about it. I also thought she was really hot, and wanted to ask her out, and thought this would be the perfect segue into it. Clever 17-year-old me, trying to impress a Wicca girl by telling her that I think I'm being possessed by a demon, or at the very least, stalked by one. I told her about it, and she was intrigued, and told me a few things I should do to keep it at bay. She told me that I should burn sage. I don't even know what sage was. That was quite hard to come by anyway. But I tried it, and it worked for a little while. But when I got bored, or lazy and stopped doing it, did the thing resurface, and it would be there again. It started to get incessant. I was becoming really, really paranoid, scared that every time I'd look in a dark space it would be there, sometimes even a light space. I just wanted this thing to be gone. So, I resorted to going down to the local church one day, and banged on the church door until someone came out. It was a priest, and I told him that I wasn't religious, but that I needed help. He listened to me, but basically dismissed me and told me to go home. I didn't know who to turn to. At this point, the girl that I'd been talking to, the wicker one, had become my girlfriend, and we'd started to get really close to each other. She started seeing the thing as well when she'd stay over. Not that my parents knew she'd stay over and she began to become frightened for my safety and well-being. She spoke to some of her wicker friends, and basically got another board. She said that maybe the best thing to do would be to say goodbye and finish the session. She and I joined hands, lit some candles, and requested to speak to Sam. Sam answered, and it was the stereotypical no to every question, but did say that it was him. Or at least, I hoped. We asked if he would please leave, and he said no. When we asked why he was haunting us, he never gave a reply. I said as loud and forcefully as I could. I'm genuinely not sure where it came from, but I screamed at the top of my lungs. Sam, you are not welcome. You're not welcome here, you're not welcome in my home, and I condemn you by the grace of God, to go back from whence you came. And then I dragged the cup up to goodbye and ended the session. 
Clever me thought that would be the end of it. And for the most part, it was. Quite boring, I know. I'm gonna be honest, I felt like quite a badass, telling a demon to go do one, and that I wanted to live my life freely. Things did crop up here and there. Shadows, things moving by themselves. But I got sleep, and never saw the apparition full scale like that again. Maybe I opened a doorway to something. Maybe I could now see things that others couldn't. I don't really know how to describe it. All that I know is that life for the most part almost went back to normality. Me and the girl actually ended up getting married and this piqued my interest in the occult and the paranormal. I don't know what would have happened to me if I'd have never met her and found a way to try and put this at bay. But I am happy with my life now and how things have turned out. I do have to be grateful though, as this experience made me who I am today. But still, it's not something I would ever dabble in again. Ever since my childhood, it has been the family knowledge and joke or inside secret that there is a ghost of a witch living in my maternal grandmother's upstairs level. My older cousin who is now in her 30s claims she remembers seeing the ghost of the witch as a child and from then on even to this day is still petrified of the stairwell and will not go up it for any reason. My slightly older cousin who is now 20 says she has been terrified with the stories of seeing the witch for years, but she, like myself, was slightly more curious about it. A few years younger, I was raised with the same tales. She and I used to climb the stairs at night with all the lights out in hopes of being able to confront the ghost witch. It had all started with my grandmother sometime in the 80s. My grandmother, my mother and her siblings and my late grandfather moved into this two story house in the early 80s. The house was under new construction when they purchased the house. My mother often boasts about how she was the one who picked the house. She was a child at the time, and she thought the unfinished house was beautiful. My grandmother and grandfather considered her opinion and gave it a look and ended up purchasing it. My grandmother has always been a person who believes in the paranormal. In her younger days, she played around with stuff like tarot and Ouija boards, but was never avid about it. Just light stuff. Her interest in such things though, spawned from learning about the heritage of the females in our family. They had been witches killed during the Salem witch trials. In fact, one of the very last witch hangings was held about five minutes from my current home. My grandmother's mother was always accused by the whole family of being a witch. This accusation may have had something to do with the fact that she was heavily abusive to my grandmother when she was young, fed her rat poison, beat the crap out of her on her wedding night, and constantly emotionally abused her. It has always been believed that her house was cursed. I only met this wicked woman about three times, and there was always something off about her. She could convince you that she was the sweetest old woman in the world, and hide how she abused her daughter and her husband. Naturally, when my grandmother found out we were descendants from witches, she considered the possibility of her mother being one more seriously. My grandmother moved her Ouija board and her tarot cards and her books about ghosts into the new house in the 80s. And only after a year or so did strange things begin to happen. My mother and grandmother both remember the first occasion of something strange. My grandmother was carrying a laundry basket up the stairs, and suddenly she could no longer continue up. She said that it was feeling like someone was standing in front of her, forceful as a wall and not allowing her to continue. She physically could not continue up the stairs, and she said that the force felt cold and hot at the same time. My mother says she remembers my grandmother trying her hardest to push against it, but not being allowed through. My grandmother calmly said, all right, let me through, and the force disappeared. 
It terrified my mother, and she said it was chilling how calm my grandmother was about it. My grandmother would often have her girlfriends over for tea at her house, as it's rather large, with two living rooms and decorative old fashioned charm. It's similar to a small mansion, and she has quite a collection of tea and antique pots and cups. One tea party in the afternoon though, would be the first visual sighting of the ghost of the witch. She was having tea with a few of her friends, all ladies, when one of the ladies looked up and over to my grandmother's shoulder. She smiled at something behind her, and returned her eyes to my grandmother and asked, Who's your other guest? I've never met her. My grandmother thought someone else had showed up, but she'd not invited anyone else. She turned around and saw that nothing was there. Her friends then began convincing my grandmother that they weren't crazy. They'd all seen her and described her as an old lady, with long wavy grey hair that's messy, in a dirty dress with the saddest most confused looking expression on her face. Though she found it quite interesting, and she did believe her friends, she remained calm about this experience as well. Those girlfriends of hers suddenly no wanted to come over to her house anymore. My grandfather passed away, and several years later my grandmother remarried. Neither of them ever experienced anything, or felt off in the house. None of the men who ever entered the house felt or saw anything at all, and some of the men are skeptics and some are believers. But regardless, none of them saw anything. It seemed the ghost of the witch would only present herself to the woman of family or women visitors. Given our heritage, it would make sense. My grandmother, who is still haunted by this ghost witch, has never had an explanation as to why everyone began regarding her as the witch. She simply said that she felt the lady was a witch. My oldest cousin, the one who is now 30, was the second one to visually see this ghostly lady. She was a teenager when she saw it, about to be 20. She was alone in the house on Christmas night, while everyone sat outside in the large garage. The family often sat out there when they smoked and spent hours in there. My cousin claimed that she was going up the stairs to use the bathroom, too embarrassed to use the one on the second floor. She didn't feel like turning the light on, and just carefully walked up guided by the light of the downstairs Christmas tree. It was then that she said she saw an old woman with a sorrowful expression and long wavy grey hair walk slowly past her at the top of the stairs. She walked her way into the computer room, which was once my mother's bedroom. It's currently, and was when my cousin had her experience, a room full of mirrors and antiques, and my great grandmother's belongings. My cousin said the old lady walked to that room, and she refused to climb the stairs to investigate. She ran out of the house, crying to her father that there was a ghost. He didn't believe her, and laughed it off. She was plagued with nightmares for the longest time, and currently refuses to go anywhere near the stairwell. After these occasions with the witch, she became a household name and my older cousin and I were raised on the spooky tales. This was one of the many things that has embedded a fascination with the paranormal and the morbid into my mind from a young age. My grandmother would tell only the young ladies of the house these stories, as the men thought she was crazy regardless of their beliefs on the paranormal, simply because they had never seen anything in the house. My grandmother told my older cousin and I the story of the night that one of her taxidermied birds came back to life for a few minutes. My grandmother and her new husband were both avid hunters and went duck hunting often, as well as fishing in ponds at night time. They had their best catch stuffed by a taxidermist and placed in a glass box. The stuffed bird sat atop in a cabin in the computer room the one the witch apparently walked to. She said that she and her husband were asleep one night when they were startled awake by a loud sound. The sound was of hundreds of birds chirping and screeching and flying. 
They thought that some birds had hatched in their attic and gotten stuck inside, so that was the first place she checked. Nothing was inside. Though not a single bird, the sound continued, and it seemed to be coming from no specific place. She couldn't locate the sound, so she went to open the computer room door, and when she did, deafening silence fell all over the house, and not a single chirp could be heard. She found the taxidermy bird on the floor, the glass box busted into tiny crystals on the floor. This story, and the infamous witch story led my curious cousin and I to venture into the computer room as many times as we could. My oldest cousin called us crazy, but we were curious and brave. We only liked to go up at night, because it created a better ambience and we felt like we had a better chance of seeing something terrifying for ourselves. We played with antique mirrors, dug through old wooden trunks in search of my grandmother's Ouija board, and did ghost chants and witch spells that we found online. When that got boring, and came with no results, we got on Microsoft Word, and wrote murder mystery stories. We'd write the most gore-filled story we could imagine, and then print it out on my grandmother's printer, and hide several copies of it around the house to creep people out. Sometimes the very old desktop computer would take control of itself and start searching for things on its own. We witnessed it type in a series of confusing codes and numbers, and then pull up various pictures of headstones and scroll quickly through them. We didn't scream and run out, as our oldest cousin would have. We simply watched in silence. The computer abruptly shutting off, and our only fear was that we would get in trouble for breaking my grandmother's computer. The lights would turn on and off in the room, not as if flickering though. They turned off and on dutifully, as if someone was doing it on purpose. Strange sounds came from the floor, like scratching and bumping, and the mirror always seemed to be in a different spot every time we turned around to look at it. Books fell off shelves, and the other, newer computer, kept on the other side of the room would fire up by itself. Before my older cousin and I could ever really delve into the witch story, she grew up. She was only a few years older than me, but her interest turned to boys and being popular in school. She had her first slide phone and stopped paying me any attention at all. We'd once been so close, but her own social standards forced us apart, and she rarely spoke to me. She was rarely mean to me, but she acknowledged me only on holidays. She evolved into a preppy popular girl while I spiralled into a paranormal obsessed young teenager who scoured the internet for gore and supernatural. And I still ventured on my own now, into that computer room upstairs. My fascination for the paranormal was far deeper than that of my cousins. Hers had just been a phase. Mine has been my entire life. Both sides of my family believe in ghosts, and each have stories of their own experiences. The only skeptic, surprisingly, is my mother. She does admit, though, that she only doesn't believe because she tries not to. Because she's scared to. My father, on the other hand, was my biggest supplier of creepy stories, and he always told me, if you go looking for something, you'll find it sooner or later because he knew how badly I wanted to explore ghosts, so I never stopped looking in my grandmother's house. My great-grandmother, nearly 102 years old at the time, was placed in a nursing home, because her house couldn't be afforded, and all the money was going into the nursing home, and the house to the state. There was an occasion where the family was invited to go collect some things from her house, anything that we liked, because they were going to get thrown away. I went and took some creepy old dolls from the 20s, and my mother took some sentimental items. When I was in my great-grandmother's bedroom alone, staring into the large Victorian mirror of hers, chills rushed through me, and I leaped when I saw a shadow dart behind me. I turned around and searched for what had made the shadow, but a strong smell of garlic and burning wood dizzled me and forced me to leave the room. The presence felt sad and angry at the same time. My aunt, 
who had more business knowledge than any of us at the time was helping my grandmother close the probate on the house. It was her job to keep the house in good condition. So she had to visit it alone frequently. On the last day of having to go inside, she went in to take the items that she wanted from the estate, a vintage lamp that reminded her of her 70s childhood. She took the lamp and bid the house and relieved farewell. She locked it up behind her. And suddenly a massive bolt of lightning struck the yard just in front of her. The rain began to pour and the wind began to howl blackened clouds bruising the sky above her making a great rage of a storm. She quickly tried to unlock the house but the keys seemed to not even fit the doorknob anymore. The door opened on its own accord after she pulled the key away. And she ran inside to shelter from the rain and sat the lamp down. She claims she saw something run through the kitchen from the corner of her eye. And with the witch rumors about her wicked grandmother, decided to leave the lamp. She closed the door behind her leaving the lamp. And when she stepped out onto the front porch, the rain had stopped. And there wasn't even a breeze, not a cloud in the sky. She still claims to this day that her grandmother's house was cursed. A few years later, my great grandmother died. I attended the funeral. And my family made jokes the whole time. My grandmother was hardly sad that this day had come as she had had to take care of the wicked woman who abused her. And she took care of her about everything she needed every day from her 70th birthday until her death at 102. She was relieved. And when the funeral home workers apologized and gave condolences, we all looked at each other. My aunt stepping out of the restroom while the big ivory casket was being rolled into the chapel accidentally whacked it with the door and nearly knocked it over killing us all as we struggled not to burst into laughter. It was the most humorous funeral we'd ever attended. After her death, my grandmother was plagued with nightmares of her mother coming back to haunt her or being trapped with her in the afterlife. One night, she found her husband walking around the house shotgun in hand. She asked him what he was doing. And he looked terrified. This was the first occasion when a man in the house had experienced something paranormal. He was shaking. And he shouted to my grandmother, your mother is here. She begged him to explain what he was talking about. And he said, I smell her. I feel her. She's here. Don't you smell that? Her mother had always worn the same perfume. Elizabeth Taylor's white diamonds. It was the only perfume she'd ever worn. And she spritzed it on herself heavily every day, sometimes twice a day. It was a scent that had sickened my grandmother's husband for the whole time he'd known the old lady. My grandmother recently tried to give us some of her mother's old jewelry, because she wanted it out of the house so badly. She claimed it was cursed. And I believed her. My aunt certainly believed her and my older cousin though so long separated from our experiences as a child refused to take the jewelry. I thought of taking it but I already owned a piece of jewelry that was passed down through the women of our family through all the witches. It's a sapphire ring that saw several generations. And for some reason I find that more coincidental that it ended up with me. After my great grandmother gave it to my grandmother. She gave it to my mother before I was born and said, give this to her. My mother didn't even know she was having a girl yet. And she asked her mother how she could assume I was a girl. And my grandmother simply said, just give this to her. And well, here I am a very paranormal type of girl wearing the witchy sapphire ring today. I haven't seen my older cousin in several years. The last time I saw her was at someone's funeral. She's a drug addict and she moved far away. My older cousin got married and moved away and hasn't given the paranormal a second thought. It seems now that her memories have been completely erased when the topic of the witch and the computer room are brought up. It's as if she's a different person. My grandmother's friends never came around anymore. And whether they admit it or not, it's because of that ghostly witch. My mother thinks that my grandmother and I are crazy. 
but it seems we simply are more sensitive to these types of things. Recently, my grandmother said that she was in a store when a short, polite old woman approached her. She was in all white robes, and she was shockingly pale, but she was friendly and exuded calm and happiness. She asked my grandmother to direct her to the exit, and she couldn't find it. When she was about to tell her where the exit was, the glowing white woman disappeared into thin air. Nobody believes me but her. I now have my own Ouija board, tarot cards, crystals, mirrors, and antique objects and dolls, as well as a dowsing rod, EMF meter, and EVP reader. For about three years, I've obsessively tried to contact one particular ghost, and it wouldn't surprise me if I opened the doors to something else in the meantime, especially when considering the lengths I've gone to. I still try to contact this particular ghost, and for now, he only reaches out to me in my dreams. But if you go looking for long enough, I'm sure you're bound to find something. My earliest memory as a kid is standing up in my crib and screaming my head off while an entity growled aggressively and shook my crib from underneath. I can still vividly remember this, even though it's been decades. Over the course of my life, I've had countless experiences and encounters, each very different than the other. By my mid-twenties, I believed I simply suffered from some sort of variation of sleep paralysis, and shoved it to the back of my mind, choosing to ignore it. However, back in 2014, I had a series of belief-changing revelations about the nature of my problems, shifting it from sleep paralysis to demonic oppression. I dream in twilight, precisely right before sunsets. It's that dark, murky light that allows you to move around the house, but makes everything grey and eerie. I've also never had a happy dream in my entire life, one where I felt excited, joy or positive in any way. I've never felt self-pity or sorry for myself. I just thought that was the way it was when you dream, having never questioned this before. I only recently discovered how weird that is through a discussion with a close friend. Greater than 90% of all my dreams slash incidents involve me laying exactly in the same position I'm sleeping in. During the incident, with twilight gleaming over everything, I can't tell that I'm actually not awake. The mood or atmosphere in the room is the blackest, loneliest, most isolating feeling with the most intense presence of evil that I honestly can't use words to convey accurately. You can only experience this sort of evil. The most vivid, detailed entities, creatures, twisted humans that have visited me. I've never seen anything like this in Hollywood movies but I can tell that someone in Hollywood writing the scripts have been inspired, most likely because they've seen them too. What do they do to me, you wonder? They're attempting to get me to engage them in a conversation, and I sense they're trying to offer me something. However, I've never engaged them. Once I realized I was being visited, my fear spiraled up to the most insanely intense levels that I could begin to hear my physical screams bleed into this dream. Right when they make a move to escalate the engagement, I exit this dark realm with a physical scream, and everything that was there just blacks out of existence. Does that sound like a classic case of sleep paralysis? That's what I told myself, and subsequently suffered for decades. I've kept a log of dozens of individual incidents over the years, but the purpose of this is to tell you my overall story. I'm excellent at my work, 
Because I can take care of explosive situations, calm enraged customers, and turn it around into a successful business relationship. I could walk into a room and sense people's moods, if they hated me, if they liked me, or if they thought me untrustworthy, if they were assholes as well. This may sound like total BS, but I can't explain it because there's no logical way to convey this to people who haven't experienced it. How do you explain the color red to a blind person who's never seen anything in their entire life? Red is red, and that's where every foundation description begins when describing that color, right? Explaining my gut sense was very much like that. Regarding animals, particularly dogs, I had an affinity that was bizarre. I like them. I'm practically the opposite of a huggy, cuddly, sensitive dude. I don't seek them out. I don't watch dog YouTube videos. I'm just cool with them, generally speaking. Anyway, I've been around hundreds of strange dogs over the past 10 years, having close and extended proximity to them. And within minutes, they'll be in my lap rolled over wagging their tail and allowing me to pet them. The people who own the dogs will usually choir off one of these things. That's weird. I've never seen Fluffy do that before. Or, wow, usually Mabel wants to kill anyone. I knew something was weird when I walked up to two drug house dogs. Think junkyard dogs. These aren't pets. They're not cuddled and are only kept outdoors and never shown affection by the owner because they have a single job to do, clear out dangerous criminal elements in drug flop house. These dogs are the shock troops that they send in after the initial verbal warning to clear out. These dogs are vicious, nasty, and basically hate all humans other than the handler that feeds them. And they always clear the house. They were in a fenced in kennel and going nuts with other people in the room. They were growling nastily through the chain links, pacing, barking threateningly. And I looked at them and felt a tug in my gut. I was completely calm and unafraid and started to walk up to the fence. The owner yelled that I better keep my distance. The dog's eyes locked with mine and I stood inches away from the dogs through the chain links. They all sat down easily and patiently watched me from a calm at ease position, completely silent and non-agitated. They seemed either comfortable or intrigued for whatever reason. The dog's owner just said, I've never seen that happen before. He was dumbfounded. These dogs would still shred me to pieces, no doubt, but I felt that they knew I would never be arrogant enough to think that I could pet them. They could have opened the kennel, and I know they would have been fine to me. To bring this back to the discussion though, over time I started to piece together that there's something weird going on with me. I slowly started to go from a complete skeptic on the supernatural my entire life, towards believing that for every new age belief, there is probably some truth of it. 2014, the year of my demonic oppression crescendo, a combination of a very stressful job and a significant upticks in incidents led to a low point in my life. I'm six foot tall and dropped to 140 pounds. For reference, I'm finally approaching 170. I'm still questioned by friends and acquaintances if I'm ill. And at the time, I looked like an extra for The Walking Dead, all without needing any makeup. I couldn't eat meat because it didn't sit well in my gut for days and would cause me immense agony. I would sleep an hour at a time, awaken, be up for an hour, and doze off repeatedly throughout the night. I've had nerve issues where my body would jerk involuntarily, and I would lose feeling in my thigh if I stood up too long. After work, or whenever I would travel out of town, often I would fall asleep right as I came home from pure exhaustion sometimes not eating and sleep until the next morning when I'd get back to work. Through all of this, I would have frequent and multiple nightly incidences that would disturb me and my wife. 
I was slowly dying physically, though I stubbornly chose to ignore it. My wife would constantly get comments like, Is he alright? What's going on? Or more to the point, He looks like he's gonna die. My wife would post pictures of me on Facebook occasionally, events or birthdays, and would immediately get responses that are horrified, asking if I had cancer. Oddly, my wife had several new age friends that would comment, he's surrounded by dark spirits, and there's a dark cloud surrounding his life aura. How can you deduce that from a photo? I have no idea, but I eventually grew to believe them in time. Emotionally, I was completely blank. I felt nothing, no sadness, no anger, no joy. The dam finally broke, when I had an incident where I woke up screaming. That part is normal, but my wife looked truly frightened this time. I asked, what's different this time? She said, you were screaming, stay away from my wife. She decided to take a non-traditional problem solving route at this point. This is when things got really weird. My wife and I went on vacation to the East Coast. On the last night, we had a bad argument and she left upset, driving to a small southern city to take her mind off things. I stayed in the hotel and she was walking along the boardwalk when a man popped out to give her a free reading to a fortune teller. She went to see the fortune teller. Keep in mind this fortune teller knew nothing about the situation. I'll reference to the fortune teller as Gypsy, and here's a breakdown of the conversation they had. The Gypsy goes, who's emotional? And my wife bursts into tears. Me. Why are you so emotional? I fight with my husband. Why? My husband isn't sleeping. It's affecting his mood drastically. It's worse than ever. He has anxiety, and he isn't sleeping. He sees something, but it isn't a dream. What do you mean it isn't a dream? It wakes him up, this thing. He isn't really an insomniac. It's something he sees every night. His eyes are open, but they aren't at the same time. Do you know what it is? Yes, it's a very bad entity. Your husband is so incredibly alone and isolated. The fear he has to deal with nightly is unimaginable. He has no one he can explain these things to. Does the entity have a name? Yes, but this is something we do not talk about. He made a contract with him in a previous life, and it wants to collect. Your husband knows him. How do we get rid of it? I could help, but he has to be ready for it. He blames me, and it's all my fault. No, your husband was like this before. It wants him to think it's you. The moment I moved in with my husband, he turned into this. No, it's not your husband. This thing is trying to drive a wedge in your relationship and try to manipulate. It wants him to go off into solitude, wants to isolate him for whatever it plans. The moment you're married, your husband, it got furious. What does it want? It wants to collect. It tries to speak with him, jabber jaw, fast flapping mouth, not really like a human movement. Your husband does exactly what he should to break out of it. Its lips are moving in the dream. Your husband does not engage. What is it saying? You do not want to know. The movement you speak to it, it gets power. It's not just vacation, it's everywhere. It's not you. It wants you to think it's you. Just ignore it. What do I do? Go back. Your husband is worried. 
about you being alone at night. This comes from his mother's side. His mother was always very odd, wasn't she? You're nothing like your mother-in-law. He has another sibling who has this. His brother? No, it's a sister. She's really into one thing that makes other people uncomfortable. She does things that makes others think she's weird. Should my husband call her and try to help? No. She tells no one about it. She suffers and deals with it on her own. She will not engage your husband in this conversation. Your husband has got to have the answer before he can figure this out. How many people have you known to have this sort of problem? Maybe three. Two have beaten it. Doesn't help that his job is wearing him out. Your husband has never had joy. He's done normal things, but never felt it. The one thing your husband has is absolute, total disappointment. He's done everything right, played by the rules, and done everything that's expected. And he still has not obtained happiness. That was the conversation. Jump to a few months later. My wife had a psychic stop by one day to read a doc. It's just the kind of novelty thing she thought would be funny. We didn't know this person. It was a paid professional visit. When the psychic arrived, I decided to walk upstairs to be friendly. And she was staring at me with a very concerned look. Hi, I said. What the heck is going on in this house? Said the psychic. What do you mean? As soon as I stepped through your door, a seriously bad entity said to me, I'm not interested in you. We discussed a little longer, and my wife asked, What should we do? She said, This isn't anything I can help you with. I'll have to talk to a shaman. I know one who's dealt with this before. At the time, I thought this might be a racket. The psychic is just setting us up for another new age service from one of her colleagues. However, this entire scenario was eventually corroborated independently from the gypsy fortune teller, who did not know this psychic or the shaman. I've never told the fortune teller their names. Yet, this is like a bad movie. Only I was living it. Fast forward to the shaman. We talked several times and I initially turned down his offer of services. He was going to visit our house and was insistent that the psychic attend. The shaman said that he couldn't do it alone, and that he needed the psychic there to help him. The psychic was surprised when I told her that the shaman was adamant in visiting my house. She said that he never visits people at their house. This bit of information is relevant later, when I meet the East Coast fortune teller later on. I schedule a time for the shaman to visit, ultimately giving up on any resistance and deciding to roll the dice. I had nothing to lose at this point. The shaman shows up in the morning, and I took the day off. He walked in, walked up to me, frowned and shook his head violently and said, I can hardly stand being near you. It's almost insufferable. Let me sage you first. He then smoked me with sage, said in some sort of Indian chant, and then looked a little more at ease. He stared at me in the eyes for an uncomfortably long time and simply uttered, You're beyond exhausted, aren't you? He nailed it in that simple sentence. They then cleared the entire house. The sage would flare up like a forest fire around certain parts of the house, denoting a portal. Where I sat in my office, the sage smoked up instantly, and more intensely than anywhere else. The shaman stated this was an extremely powerful and extremely evil entity that had been attached to me my entire life. I asked him what it was, or if he knew its name. The shaman said he did know its name, but refused to say it out loud. He did state that he only knew of one other person that this particular entity had haunted. 
he cut off this line of questioning and proceeded to clear the house. As they were wrapping up, the shaman again stood in front of me, staring uncomfortably long, then asked a very odd and simple question. Do you love yourself? That struck me as oddly, as I'd never really been asked that. I smiled, pondered, and then a revelation happened several hours after he left. I internally forgave myself for being a failure. Simply put, I felt a knot in my guts loosen that had been there my entire life, but I had just ignored. An exhausted calmness rolled over me. This was the pivot point I'd been waiting for my entire life. Fast forward to June 2015. I had far, far fewer incidents at this time and started to feel better between the shaman visit and this vacation. My wife wanted me to go see the fortune teller since I had never met them. I didn't have any agenda, so I agreed, thinking it could be intriguing academically. While driving there, I told my wife oddly, suddenly out of the blue, she knows I'm coming. I can't say why I said this. I just knew it to be the truth. I arrive in the fortune teller's parlor. After a minute or so of typical stranger small talk, the fortune teller abruptly stated, I know who you are. And I knew you were coming. No kidding. Exactly what I'd said days earlier while driving there. The fortune teller actually recalled the details of my wife's visit back in late September 2014. It was creepy and amazing at the same time. The context of all her comments and observations were all in line with my wife's visit last year. Another eerie thing was that the fortune teller looked like she could be related to my mother, almost as if they were sisters. I did have some small area of doubt at first, but my gut sense was telling me this fortune teller was the real deal. The shaman was afraid of you and what was targeting you. When he first walked into your house, he wanted to turn around and run away. He didn't bring his helper, the psychic, to protect him. He brought his helper in order for the entity to attach to his helper, thinking she would be weaker and it would go for her rather than him. He thinks she is weaker than himself. He did it to protect himself. When I spoke to the shaman several times while brokering a visit, he always insisted that he needed to bring a second person. I thought he was trying to dupe me for more service fees. Maybe that's how this group of psychics feed into each other's business. In hindsight, the fee was ridiculously low. $100 for the shaman to come on site and 50 for his helper for three hours. It wasn't about the money, but they did need compensation for their time and travel. This wasn't a moneymaker for them. In hindsight, I think they genuinely did want to help me. I have no gut feeling regarding the fortune teller's reading on the shaman's motivation to bring the other psychic along for the home visit. It's possible, maybe even probable given his avoidance behavior later on in the story. The shaman is afraid of you. Also, about a week before we went on vacation and visited the fortune teller, I saw the shaman at a public event. He noticed me and looked away and looked visibly uncomfortable. I got a really weird feeling in my gut, like he wanted to avoid me altogether. I said, thank you, things are better than they were. And he rapidly waved, nodded his head, turned away abruptly and began talking to someone else. He did not want to engage me in any manner. The gypsy said that people used to be afraid of me, not in a physical sense or that I could harm them, but they would avoid me. And this is possible. It's hard to self evaluate this. I've had random panhandlers tell me, I don't want anything from you. You look mean. Not great for the self confidence, but I've always brushed it off. Another thing the gypsy said, 
is that I've sought help several times in the past, but none have helped me. That they were afraid of me, but not of me, rather what surrounds me. And although that's true, I did visit a shaman before, no one clued into my self-loathing. The gypsy went on to say that my mother experienced this entity haunting her the entire time she was pregnant, that she was extremely scared and worried, and she thought that she was going to lose me or miscarry, and that I was a high-risk pregnancy in multiple ways. It's important to note that this is true. Both my mum and dad had told me they were afraid they were going to lose me over the course of years. I've never thought once to ask what they actually meant by that. The gypsy said that my mum would sometimes not go to sleep for nights on end while she was pregnant, in order to avoid the entity visiting her at night. She had constant nightmares during her entire pregnancy. And that there was also a large sum of money for that time period. She, of course, was speaking of my mother's youth that was stolen. Someone either directly or indirectly lost their life as a result of this. And that my mum's side of the family has had money come and go, but none of them have found happiness and all still struggle to this day. This is true. My grandfather and uncle stole land rights from my mum and her sisters that were deeded to them. They forged documents, sold the rights and took the money. The lawsuit went on for decades and wrapped up shortly after my mum's death over 10 years ago. It was a big deal on her side of the family and created a schism they never recovered from. I said that my wife thinks that we should reconnect with my mum's family to figure out what might have happened. But the gypsy said no and to stay away from them and that my mother kept me from them for good reason, that nothing good could come out of reconnecting. She went on to say that my mum expected to lose me early in life. Her biggest fear was the entity getting to me, and that several weeks before her death, she called me to plead that I turn towards the light in her own way. She knew that something was going to happen to her very soon, and she was driven to make sure that I was safe, even after she was gone. Everything she said, she nailed it. The last time I spoke with my mum was when I was living in a different state. I recall it being just a few weeks before she was killed. Mum called one night after work and went on for hours about getting back to church, praying and making sure I take care of my spiritual side, getting right with God. I spoke very little and sadly blocked out much of what she was saying. I said all the right things to my mum, but I was just on autopilot just trying to appease her and get her off the phone. I was exhausted from work, and I blew mum off mentally while on the phone. This was the only time I can recall my mother being preachy. That was the only thing I recall her talking about. I still have some lingering guilt about my mindset on that phone call with my mum. The gypsy went on to say that while I sleep, the entity tries to show me something. And I sense that the entity puts a hand over my wife's mouth in order to stop her from waking me. The gypsy went on to say that since the shaman visited and I've forgiven myself or at least started to love myself, the entity is no longer in the room while I sleep at night. Then she said, why do I have visions of two floors of a house with people sleeping on both? And I reply, my screaming in the night was becoming so bad that it was having an effect on my wife's health. I'm sleeping downstairs at night in order to get control of it. I don't feel the same entity plaguing me, but I still get frequent visitations by other beings that cause me to yell out. It's different, but I'm still yelling out into the night too frequently for my wife to rest easy. I see a tiny room which opens up to a bigger and then larger room that you can look out of, over and through it. This tiny room with a tiny door is where the shaman trapped the entity. It's still in the house. She described the sump pump room exactly. The shaman was extremely bothered by this room. The sage he was burning bloomed like a forest fire around that room. 
the shaman didn't finish his job and didn't tell you the truth. All the crystals he gave you need to be buried down a road you can never drive past regularly or thrown into a river somewhere. The crystals have absorbed the negative power and are keeping it there. Somehow, she knew there were power crystals placed throughout our house. Once again, uncanny and creepy. I see a teenager who is very angry. Yes, that's our neighbor's grandson. Is he dangerous? No, he's not dangerous. He's very angry because of his grandparents' anger. Your presence is causing every neighbor around you to be affected. They're afraid of you, and you're staring it up for them, making it worse. You will do a lot of good for people in the future. Just not right now. You're still working through a lot of things. People will seek you out for your help. You know we're both Christian. The Bible doesn't cover what you do in cases like this. That's why I'm not conflicted by coming to you. These two work in parallel and don't necessarily cancel out or contradict each other. No one in church or no pastor would deal with things of this manner. They would view me as possessed and just pray over me. It would help. But it's not enough, the gypsy said. For a period of time, the entity had you believing that you were seeing things, things that couldn't possibly exist. Footnote, she nailed it. How can she know this? I've always believed that I've had two types of events. One is simple dreams. The other is when I would lose the ability to tell if I was awake or asleep. These are extremely vivid and the entities that visit me have details that I could draw and paint as if I were using a magnifying glass on the dream. I'm able to zoom in on these things in the encounter rather than the details unraveling. They just get more vivid. I've always believed I was seeing something with my waking eye and not dreaming. Since the fortune teller made this comment, I've shifted my belief that these aren't physical manifestations anymore. At least, not physical in our dimension. I have no doubt they're real in a different manner. However, the gypsy went on. Others in your family have this going on. For one, it has gotten worse recently. Everyone in your family isolates themselves. They call each other, but that's just going through the motions. This has affected your entire family, but no one talks about it between them. This is why no one calls each other. She wants to isolate and keep each person to their self. She also nailed the family dynamic. We never talk about our feelings with each other. I believe one sister has it the worst. She has been out there mega religious for decades now. She is also the sister that I'm the most distant with. Ironic? I'll help you with this. You can do this over the phone and I tell you what you need to complete in your house. I don't want money from you. She gave me 45 minutes of her time and refused to accept money from me. I don't know what this means or why she would be motivated to refuse money or why she would help me for free. But she went on to say, the whole time the shaman was there and had you go through his rituals, you didn't feel it. You felt like it was doing nothing. Yeah, I know it wasn't doing anything. The only thing that resonated was his question. Do you love yourself? I answered yes, but realized I didn't really mean it at the time. I started to think about it. And over the course of a few days, I felt in my gut that I forgave myself. This was when things started to improve. The entity hasn't visited me since November in my dreams. The shaman played his role, but didn't finish the work. Don't have him come back, even though he suggested another cleansing of the house. The crystals you have scattered around, you need to rid yourself of them. Bury them along a roadside you never travel down, or throw them into a creek or river you never cross in your travels. She also somehow knew about these crystals the friends had given us. They're under the bed, and in front of the mirror, and scattered throughout the house. You have a very strong power in you that can be used for good. You have an ability. I can help you develop it but you will have to deal with this situation. Once you figure it out, people will seek help from you. 
I also have no idea what she means by this, but I didn't ask any questions. Other psychics I've seen have said that I'm really powerful, and if I've ever thought about developing my abilities. This is the allure I think a lot of people would find cool, but I find it completely horrifying. I'll never pursue this, I just want to be normal. I just want to sleep. Towards the end of the reading, she said, That's your wife out there. Did she want a viewing? Just to note, my wife had shown up in the waiting room, yet somehow knew this even though the doors were closed. Yes, she wanted to talk with you. No, not tonight. Not after talking to you. Maybe on Tuesday. I've got to go do some meditation in preparation for Tuesday. The fortune teller did not meet with me or my wife after this reading. Her shop wasn't open for business for the rest of the week, and she would not return any of my phone calls until later that week, while we were there. I called her and left voice messages with no return calls from her. I can't fathom the reason why she would do everything she has done for us thus far, take no money and then simply not communicate with me. She effectively cut me off. This worried me for a time, but I eventually stopped sweating on this. I didn't need her help as time progressed. I was a skeptic my entire life on the paranormal. Even when I was at ground zero with my own instance. I dismissed them as sleep disorders, having a medical basis at worst. Having three independent, new agers engage me at length and nail stuff they couldn't possibly have known about, has turned me into a believer in the supernatural. While I believe in the supernatural and that new age people have actual power, I personally and strongly advise against pursuing this. Out of desperation, I gave up and got involved. Well, they did convince me it's real, and led me to ending my self-loathing and getting lasting peace. Their superpowers didn't prove any magical cure. Maybe they were put in my path to learn the simple lesson of love thyself. That is what makes most sense to me. My belief is that these demonic entities latch onto your own initial damage that's deep inside of you, and unfortunately, only you can remove this hook they have onto you. I don't believe I did this alone, however my entire life I've been a Christian. Though admittedly, I'm probably not a paragon of how you live your life. I've always felt safe while I'm awake and doing normal everyday things. My gut tells me this is God's presence. In my twilight dreams, however, I don't feel this same level of protection, and have a theory. Hell's worst punishment, biblically speaking, is the lack of God's presence. My theory for these twilight dreams is that I'm glimpsing into some version of hell. I'm on their territory, and there is a lessening of God's presence. I think I have a kernel of his presence still in me, but I have an indescribable fear that it's completely off the charts. I have just enough help and strength to scream my way out of there thankfully. My advice is to not pursue supernatural things, because it won't end well. Engagement is almost certain to ensure something hooks onto you. Regarding my affinity for dogs, I now believe this to be instinctive in them. I think dogs can see things people can't. I think dogs sense the oppression around me, and instinctively engage me protectively. I genuinely appreciate this, and happily accept it. I always feel more protected with any dog around. They are pretty amazing creatures. Presently, I get tested periodically by these entities, though it's not the same one that haunted me my entire life. I can tell you how I know this. Unfortunately, but they do check in to test the waters. I had one of the other nights after three months of peace, it was twilight, I heard rumbling electrical resonance, and felt a tingle in my head. I felt the isolation, heard the shuffling outside my bedroom door, and saw the door open, heard the scrambling feet, and saw a levitating grey animal. It was like a dead thing floating up at the foot of my bed. 
It was trying to emulate a friendly animal, perhaps a dog, but it did a very poor physical manifestation and was reeking of evil, closer to roadkill, just floating in the room staring at me. I stared at it and was able to utter, Get out now. Very weakly, but with conviction. I awoke instantly in my twilight dream, and in the waking world I heard now in both places, if that makes sense. The room was evil, dark and overbearing one moment, and then completely clear and normal and pleasant in the next instant. I didn't wake up screaming. I woke up fully aware that I had just ordered it out. There was no confusion, fuzziness, or fading memory that you usually have with your dreams after you're awoken. My only real agenda is to get these sort of life experiences out to the masses. I hope to get acknowledgement that people like us aren't crazy and ideally help people directly or indirectly start to deal with this by having a conversation about it. From when I was young, I had nightmares. Nightmares about giants. These giants could see through the windows, they were so tall and thin. If there was a gap around the shades, they could still see in. If I hid under my mother's bed, the dust ruffle didn't go all the way to the floor, so they would still see me. In these nightmares, I would hide in the closet, try to open the door as well as I could, and hide under a pile of clothes. One morning, I woke up in that closet. Throughout my youth, I'd have nightmares of a similar sort. I could not sleep near a window, especially if it was an open window, even in summer. One time, it was tall, skinny monkeys on the roof trying to get in, or it would be triangular objects in the sky flying at very high speeds. All the time, I knew nothing of aliens, and I joined a group that dealt with all manner of oddness, including UFOs. I mentioned these nightmares, and they were convinced that I was an abductee. It began making sense, as these nightmares would often occur about the time I was ovulating, including one nightmare when I woke up on a table in a room, with something like a huge metal bowl inverted in me. I swore I could hear my mother's voice telling me I was okay, and that they weren't going to hurt me. They needed to just do these tests. Then, I saw them. I watched them stick a very long and thin needle-like tool into my abdomen on the left, as they extracted an ova, which they showed me. I saw it as if it were magnified, roundish cream-coloured, with an area that was a little more brownish. They explained to me this one was damaged and they'd need another. I remember thinking, cool. Then realizing what I said and what was going on, I pretty much passed out and not woke up again until the morning. As I said, this was a regular occurrence. Until one year during ovulation, I happened to be on a military base. Apparently they weren't going to arouse the ire of the US military. After that, the abductions ceased. I was getting older anyway, and my viability was probably not up to snuff. Fast forward many years, I was house-sitting way out in a rural area. There are neighbours, but they're a bit spread out, but they're 15 miles from the nearest town in a heavily wooded area. I'd gone to bed around 1.32, and had turned off all the lights and gotten to bed facing the window, and closed my eyes. Soon, I could tell there was light shining in through the window. Odd, but not completely unheard of that someone would be driving down that road a little late. I then realised I didn't hear gravel, and the light didn't seem to move. Was someone sitting outside my house with their headlights on? I got out of bed and peeked through some blinds, and saw what made me do a backflip and go over to the bed to get my glasses. I slammed them on my face, bounced back to the window, and what I saw made my blood run cold. Across the street is nothing but a line of trees. Behind those trees were huge white lights, the size of the full moon, drifting very slowly downwards at an angle. When the white lights were behind the trees, I could see red lights around them. Back behind those trees is nothing but a very large swamp. 
there was no noise, and I stood there staring blankly until I could no longer see the lights. Needless to say, there was no sleep to be had on my part, and I kept looking out the windows, expecting to see little green men out in the front yard. It was a little easier to handle when I could put my experiences down to just nightmares, but I was too well aware and fully awake for this one. This story took place when I was 17, Christmas of 2015. For two weeks, my dad and I had decided to spend Christmas with our family, as I have always dreamed. He booked our tickets, and two months later we were on a plane to London, England. After an eight-hour plane ride, we were safely in London. Despite my anxiety, my uncle was there to drive us to the countryside, which took about four hours overall as we ended up visiting family on the way to the countryside, food stops and toilet breaks. We finally made it to Helston, Cornwall. For the remainder of the two weeks, I would be staying alone with my wonderful grandparents, and my dad would be staying with his brother and his brother's now ex-wife. Most of what I remember from the trip was exploring Helston and Turo, eating a lot of Walker's crisps, illegally drinking alcohol in pubs because nobody ever asked for my ID, and going clothes shopping. I remember getting an eerie feeling almost the moment I got there. I had felt that way when I was at my grandparents' house two summers before that, and the many other homes I visited, and plenty of those homes are fairly old. I remember falling asleep many times, and I had this unnerving notion that someone was staring at me, or these random brushes of cold air when I would be laying in bed or making food in the kitchen. I never mentioned anything. If I ignored it, it would go away. Right? Well, you're dang right. It didn't. I felt safer with my door closed, because it felt like something was standing down that short but dark hallway leading to the living room. I would hear random noises almost every night, but I put it up to the fact that maybe I was just hearing my grandparents talk in their sleep, or because the house was old, that the house was settling or some other stuff. Despite the weird feelings, I was getting almost 24-7. I tried to ignore it, and did so successfully a few times. It all came to head, when on New Year's Eve, I returned home at around 2.50am. I was really hungry, as my cousins threw a frozen pizza in the oven, and I wouldn't touch that stuff. I had had a few beers earlier on in the night, and I had two after midnight, so me seeing things wasn't out of the realm of possibility. I got this craving for a ham sandwich put the rest of my beers in my room, dressed in my pyjamas and went to the kitchen. Besides the kitchen, was this little sun room that would lead out back. There was a top level and a bottom level. The top level was open, but my grandparents were keeping the bottom level locked as it was far too cold and the heating was practically non-existent in the bottom level. The kitchen was lit up. But the top level of the sum room was almost completely dark. As I was making my sandwich, I casually looked to the right. As I was buttering my bread, in the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like a tall yet hunched over figure. At first, I believed that I was just being paranoid, put my stuff back in the fridge, and when I turned, the figure was still there. Anyone who listens to this, if you've ever played Left 4 Dead, does anyone remember the witch? Well, this strange shadowy creature looked like a dark, tall version of the witch. I couldn't make out any noticeable facial features, only a bony figure with long and bony fingers. The creature had long, almost stringy hair. It was almost as if the lights were beginning to dim 
just by the creature being there, and I swear, it was somehow moving closer. But I hadn't seen one of its ginormous legs move once. I could feel my heart beating incredibly fast, just as it is now, while I remember this, because I can still remember the feeling, and I still fear that I will see that creature again. I turned my fat ass around, sandwich in hand, and ran into my room. I felt a little nauseous, and could barely finish my sandwich. I just wanted to go to bed, so that it could be daylight once again, and that if I was going to be killed, I'd hopefully be asleep if any strange demon decided it wanted me as a snack or something. I was going to be sleeping there for two more nights. I just had to get past it and stay strong. I didn't see that creature again during the rest of my stay there. I tried to get out of that house as much as I could, and was successful in doing so. The last creepy thing that happened when I was laying in bed at around 4am was we had a flight at 12, so I had to be up early for the long drive, and since the weather was abysmal, we wanted to leave early. I remember talking to my friend on Facebook, and I was talking about how scared I was of the flight. She told me I was going to be fine, that I wasn't going to die, and that I would get home safely in no time. When she told me that I wasn't going to die, I was like my body was being taken over and I said out loud, but I'm already dead. I told my dad what happened a few days after we got home. He said that maybe I saw the angel of death or something. I have no clue. I was, and still am, extremely freaked out, as it might just be one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had with something that was clearly paranormal. The only reason I think it's real is because usually when I'm drunk or tipsy, I don't tend to take much notice of things. But when I saw this thing, it was like I had been snapped back to reality, and I couldn't even feel the alcohol I had been drinking before this moment. I'm sure there must be some sort of explanation. Perhaps I was just still feeling the effects of the alcohol. Or maybe I was tired, and all of it just added up to a very creepy hallucination. Or maybe something more. Let me give you a bit of background. I am an 18 year old male. I'm 5 foot 10 and not the biggest guy, and have been seeing and hearing things since I was 6. This story takes place in the fourth house I lived in, as we're currently on my fifth and was where the activity really picked up and actually scared me half to death. To the best of my recollection, my first accounts of the paranormal was when I was six years old. I heard footsteps around me when I would be in the basement, and then something had grabbed a pile of papers of my drawings off my dresser in my room and thrown them against the adjacent wall. It didn't help that my aunt had a dark entity in her basement who took the form of a large imposing man. I personally never saw him, but my cousins did. We can't stand to be down there for longer than a minute, and would sprint up the stairs. This all took place in my second house, then in my third, when I was 12 or so. Visual phenomenon started to occur. It was here where I saw doors open and close, shadow figures on two occasion, and an apparition of a tall and lanky male in a striped shirt and jeans out of the corner of my eye. After that, the occurrences stopped for years. I thought I wouldn't see anything again, but I have never been so wrong in all my life. It was about two years after I moved to my third house in 2017. I was 17 at the time, and had an unfinished basement with concrete floors and no drywall, and a completely open area. There were three light bulbs in this basement. The shape of the basement was almost a deformed O shape, and the lights were placed at the ends of the U, and one end in the middle. So whenever I went to work out in the basement, only the light bulb in the space in front of me, one of the other ends, would start to flicker and flash, sometimes fast, other times not. It would only happen when I stepped onto the treadmill, 
and would keep going till I stopped completely off, even if the treadmill was off. Then I would occasionally see a shadow in that space when I'm not moving. This shadow would peek its head up from some boxes, and then duck back after I noticed. My cats would also look over at a space and as if someone was standing there. However, these lights were the occurrences that led up to what would be happening later. It was a Sunday night in summer at about 1am. I was watching comedy YouTube videos and working on a piece of digital art. Out of habit, and so I can hear my family if they call me whenever, I have my headphones off one ear, and it was dead silent. My cats were with me at the time, both being asleep next to me. It was a little while after that I heard a blood curdling scream, as if a murder had just occurred downstairs. Only a few seconds after the scream and taking my headphones off, did I hear a woman's voice. To my best recollection, the voice of the woman was corresponding to the scream and said, Why are you screaming? So I'm practically floored and had to investigate. I walk out of my bedroom and down the hall to the loft area and staircase. At first I had tried to rationalize that maybe my sister had a nightmare, and my mum woke up and checked on her. So I checked her room which was upstairs, and lo and behold my little sister was asleep in bed, having passed out while watching makeup tutorials. Officially creeped out, I head to the stairs and lean over the railings, and I'm met with complete and utter darkness. There were no lights, no glow from the TV, and at this point I am just a mix of confused and concerned, but will myself go back to my room. So I settled down in bed, and continued on the commission I was on, but this time I kept my headphones off and worked in silence, my senses on high alert. It was about 15 minutes or so before the activity continued. Surprisingly loud footsteps started up the carpeted stairs and up to the loft area. It was then, I'm pretty sure at that point I had paled a few shades, and a male voice sounded from the loft, and I can tell it wasn't my dad, and surely wasn't me. So I got into protective mode, since, unlike my room, my little sister's room was accessible from the loft, so I grabbed the only weapon I had in the room, a switchblade, as I thought it was possible an intruder could be in the house. I texted one of my exes, as we're still friends, who was still awake in the group chat we had. I told him what was going on, and that if I didn't answer in a certain time frame saying it was okay, to call the police. So I searched the house and couldn't find anyone. I looked on all levels of the house, and looked to see if there was a car outside, if the doors were open, and a window cracked. There were no signs of intrusion. These events were only the starting point of what was to come. So as the months passed, there was the usual flickering and shadow in the basement, but I figured the light was just a wiring issue and was logical. That was until it started answering questions. I was messing around once after I was working out and was like, fine, if someone is there, make the lights flicker twice. And it did, on command. I never asked more questions. I didn't want to get involved with whatever that thing was. However, it kept going on, and I heard footsteps on several occasions in the hall. A shadow figure came up behind me, another scream, and something touched my hand at one point. So much activity was occurring that I kept a journal on my phone of the time and days of these occurrences to see if I was going crazy or not. After about a month, I was pissed off and started badmouthing whatever it was when I was in the basement and instantly regretted it. As soon as the final word escaped my lips, I felt an immense burning sensation on my hip under my clothing. I pulled my clothing away and was greeted by a scratch running about five inches, starting at my hip and ending just above my mid thigh. Then about two days later at 1am, I was sleeping in my room and heard the papers of my desk start rustling and moving around as if someone were going through my stuff. 
my first instinct is that my kitten who is extremely mischievous was there. The thing was, there wasn't anyone there. I roll over onto my stomach and look at my tomcat, who's on the bed with me. He's looking wide eyed behind me and starts to puff up like those Halloween decorations, a large growl in his throat. I was about to speak to him when I feel what felt like two hands on my shoulder blades and a pressure on my lower back like when someone sits on you. It felt as if one of my friends was sitting on me after we tussled. At first, I thought, am I experiencing sleep paralysis? I've never had sleep paralysis, but my mum has. And that was when I realized that I was awake and able to move. Instinctively, I start trying to thrash around and get whatever is on top of me off. Whatever it was wouldn't let up off my stomach. So I was swinging my arms behind me. When my arms struck the area above my back, I felt an immense cold as if I had plunged my arm into an ice bath. However, this somehow got whatever it was off me and I instantly flipped myself over to sit up and look around at nothing. It was at this time that my cat started to calm down again, but neither of us fell back asleep that night. It was later on in the day where I felt the same burning sensation a few days prior on my other hip, and an almost complete cut was on my leg. It was completely incidental in placement and length as the previous one, but this time whatever did it drew blood. And this time I had enough, and took every kind of measure I could to keep this thing at bay. Luckily, this stopped as we moved out two months later or so. Whatever it was didn't follow me to my new house. And I have been able to live two years without these experiences and be at peace. However, there are times where I wonder what that thing was, and wonder what it wanted. Did it only ever want to hurt? Was it trying to do something else? I don't know. And even if this was only curiosity, I don't want to find out. From what I've heard, a new family lives there. And now I wonder if they have experienced anything like I had. After some research, I think the figure or the entity could be called a night hag. It's a spirit that forces you down in some cases of sleep paralysis. I learned of the figure of speech from my grandfather on my mother's side, as he has a similar experience and he would claim that there would be a witch on his back. I later found out from my mother that it's a saying mostly from the African American community, even if this is a global phenomenon, that there is a witch on your back. In my family's case, it is from the folklore in Africa. I don't know which area yet. I'm not sure if it was a witch, but it sure as hell scared the crap out of me. And I still can't explain what happened to me. This happened back in the fall of 2015. At the time I was doing long distance with my girlfriend and was loving the bachelor life. That meant crappy YouTube rabbit hole documentaries, ancient aliens, the whole nine yards, no drugs at all. So I'm four hours deep into Stephen Greer's video and he's talking about what he does out in the desert with some of his followers and I totally expected this to look fake. But it really did seem like they were seeing UFOs, and were able to invite slash summon them for lack of a better term. And Dr. Greer talks about how if you want to have an experience, you can do this on your own. So I did. I was feeling brave. Aliens scare me, but after four hours of Dr. Greer telling me they're so nice, I figured what the hell? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. The results were as follows. So it must have been around 1 to 2 a.m. I'm laying in bed before I go to sleep, and I picture myself directly above where I am laying, on the roof of my house, shooting a floodlight into the sky from the top of my head. I forget if this was what Dr. Greer, or if that was something I picked up from somewhere else. Keep in mind, this is just me picturing slash visualizing. This is no x file stuff quite yet. And I'm asking the universe slash night sky slash aliens in my head 
kind of like a radio, for an experience. And I make it very clear in my mind that I do not want to be scared, and that I get scared by the idea of aliens very easily. Eventually I fall asleep. What happens next is hard to describe. I wake up, and I'm sitting up in bed, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. I'm facing the door at a diagonal angle, and I see this light. This light is like nothing I've ever seen before or since. It is the brightest, most penetrating light I've ever seen, but it didn't hurt my eyes to look at it. In fact, it was kind of nice. It was mostly gold with yellow, green and blue rays coming out of it. Like, it couldn't make up its mind on what colour it wanted to be. I've never done psychedelics, but I wonder if this is what people would describe if they choose to. There was a silhouette of two skinny little legs sitting in front of the light, kind of swaying a little. I couldn't tell you if this lasted 30 or 3 seconds. All that I remember is that I felt like, okay, that's neat, and went back to sleep unceremoniously. I didn't hear a voice in my head, at least I didn't think I did, and felt like I just wanted to go back to sleep. At the time, I wasn't scared in the slightest, which in retrospect, didn't make a lick of sense, as I suspect this little green or grey visitor wanted it that way and had a hand in it. The next day, I am cold sweating, and I'm not well to say the least. I barely show up to work, and while I'm at work I go through the motions and maybe say a sentence or two the entire day. Same thing for almost the entire week. The day after, I tried to draw what I saw and remembered, thinking it would help. I felt like I needed to. It was pretty much exactly what I had described to you. Conclusion I had had a handful of dreams about aliens before. In all of them, I'm scared having a fight with no fight or flight reflex. So the dreams just ended up being Conan fests with me punching Grays in the face, terrified. During the dream, I wasn't scared at all, not even a smidge. I've never dreamed of me being off world or anything like that. I also had cold sweats for days and made it difficult to talk about or even write about. My story seems pretty tame compared to some other accounts, but it is quite spooky. And I never have had sleep paralysis or sleepwalked. This is not satire. I'm not looking for your fake online attention or internet points, nor would I waste my time. I believe that there is something supernatural happening to me. Either that, or I'm developing schizophrenia. Let me go back to the start. About 10 years ago, I was in a very dark place. I was becoming a sociopath. Yada yada, crappy childhood. Anyway, I never believed in God. Or at the least, the stereotypical man in the sky with a beard. Obviously, whatever God is, it's far more powerful and far smarter than some petty, angry God who actually cares about the clothes that people wear and who they sleep with. But there was a divine power that has always been indisputable. Anyway, I hated everyone, myself most of all. I don't remember it exactly, but at some point I found myself praying to the Divine that I would do anything to not be me, and not in a good way. As I said, I was in a very dark place. The Divine I was praying to was not loving. I wanted power more than anything, and as insane as this sounds, I felt energy go through me, like goosebumps, but on the inside. Not adrenaline either, it's completely different. Ever since then, I've been able to temporarily make this feeling flow through my body, but I have to go to a dark place or to meditate. That's not the interesting part. This started about four years ago. I had matured quite a bit since then and I was not nearly as dark and unhappy as I used to be, and very occasionally used mushrooms, LSD, and DMT, all in less than 10 times for everything. 
I was living with my grandparents at the time, and they are your stereotypical Christian old school grandparents. I was smoking a bowl at my house while my grandparents were at work. They never came home before five. It was somewhere around noon, when I was smoking, that I heard a loud bang coming from my shed. I understood immediately that I needed to stop and go inside. So, I did. Not one minute later, my grandmother pulled in, because she had forgotten her phone. Ever since then, occurrences just like this happened to me. One time I needed a Ziploc bag, and when I opened my door to my room, there was a Ziploc bag right on the ground in front of it. Now, whenever I'm about to make a bad decision, I can hear certain noises. Not noises in my head, but if there's a sharp cracking noise to my right side, such as a water bottle crinking, or a pen rolling to hit the floor, just any high-pitched noise, I know the decision that I'm about to make is not a good one. If I hear a train before I make a decision, it's always every single time has led to a positive outcome. Sometimes I'll wish for something to happen when I'm stressed out. For instance, I was doing landscaping for my uncle, and I was basically just shoveling gravel into a wheelbarrow and moving it for eight hours for three days. Yes, I was being a little brat about it. I just begged for anything to happen to me so that I could get out of it. 30 minutes later, my father arrived and told me my other uncle had overdosed on heroin and that we were leaving to go see everyone. I've even started seeing figures out of the corner of my eye. Sometimes I'll see a tracer or experience microplasia. I've experienced a green flash. I get random visions of an eyeball when I close my eyes sometimes. I once woke up at about 3 a.m and was seeing visions of my cat. I could feel it outside the room, wanting in. My cat was sitting right there waiting for me when I opened the door. These occurrences happen frequently now. Maybe because I've learnt to see the signs, or maybe because I'm slowly losing my mind. All of this could be coincidence. All of it could be in my head. But I don't think so. I feel like it's a demon, but not in a bad way. I'm not afraid of it. I've tried to talk to it, but I always lose focus when I try. I do hear something speak to me when I focus and try, but never more than a few seconds. Even when I meditate and clear my mind, it's the same story. Did I summon a demon when I was younger? I offered my soul for power. That seems like a pretty bad idea to me looking back now. Any advice? Any experts, anything like that, would be much appreciated. About nine years ago, my dad's side of the family was talking about how they would hear and see witches in their younger days. My grandfather started to explain on how his father would see ladies at night walking towards this small lake in the outskirts of town, and they all carried a cat each which he pointed out that cats didn't seem to have eyes, so it was rare to see these ladies. He said this was mostly at 2 to 3 a.m., because at 5 a.m., he would go to wash his clothes as the small lake was connected to the other water source, and the ladies would always seem to leave about 5 a.m. when he and the other people would show up. Even my grandma had encountered them, and I'm not sure because she sadly passed away before my dad turned five. But I know that my grandfather said she would always be scared of them because they had long nails and wore hoods. Not only this, small kids would always end up with bite marks. Full moon days were the worst, as it seemed like there was smoke at the lake, and somehow it made people afraid to go early. He did say something about trying to go into and do some witch hunts, but oddly enough, the guy that he was going to do it with never appeared. This guy's disappearance connected to him, talking later on some treasure that the ladies had given him to leave them alone. Two others had gone with him, but only one showed up, 
and he had gone mad. I couldn't speak anymore, just scream. He'd been traumatized by something, and he died in hospital days later. Many years later, the infrastructure in the area became more prevalent, and the sightings of those ladies vanished. There are mountains that are said to be the home of their new location, although it's more common than the city folk believe in them less as the rural areas are where they seem to congregate. I was staying at a friend's house in Hollywood in the guest room, and was trying to sleep. I think I passed out for an hour or so, but I ended up waking up and being unable to fall back asleep. I do not believe this was sleep paralysis or a dream, because I was fully conscious and awake when it happened. I was also able to move and speak and see the room decently, even though it was dark. I've had sleep paralysis a few times before. It's very rare for me, and I didn't feel paralyzed or panicked. I was listening to music with my earbuds in, and my eyes closed, when I felt the presence of something in my room, and a tap on my arm. It startled me a bit, and I sat up straighter when I saw in the dark, right beside my bed, the figure of a woman. I couldn't make out much of her features, but she was probably five foot two and hunched over with very pale skin that seemed to glow. She had messy mid-length black hair, several necklaces and long earrings. She moved in a very fluid manner and almost seemed to glide as she walked and reached out towards me. She seemed to be trying to hide her face by holding her hand over it and pulling her hairs across it. She held out a handwritten note that had many of the lines on it scratched out aggressively. It seemed like it was about my life. I don't know exactly what happened, but I swear she was able to telepathically communicate with me. And she said, It's better this way, don't you think? As she handed me the note to look at. I was almost in a trance or something, because I was in absolute awe of what was happening. But I handed the note back without absorbing any of it and said, Yeah, I agree. Out loud. She took it back and quickly turned away. And just like that was gone. And my door was left open. It took me a good minute to try and process what happened. And I quickly ran over to my friend in his girlfriend's room. And asked them if she had come into my room. But she said otherwise. She told me she was having trouble sleeping too and had seen some odd flashes of light outside her window a few times that night. I went outside to smoke a cigarette, and felt an incredible sense of peace and calmness overcome me, and I didn't feel worried about the encounter, because throughout it all, I didn't feel like I was in danger. She seemed like she was trying to protect me, or watch over me, and I was okay with that. I know it sounds stupid, but I can hear and see demons. I can't see them face to face, but what I can do is see their reflection in TVs, mirrors and windows. The one I see in the reflection of most wears a black cloak and looks very old, so you can't see his face because the cloak is covering it up, and he has sharp nails that look like razors. He has a hunchback which makes him stand and sit weird, and he has a voice of a man in his thirties that smokes. This one isn't that mean, and the most he says to me is what are you doing, and how are you, in his low voice, but it's nothing bad. The other one I've never seen, but I've heard it speaking to me. It was around four in the morning, and I just got a new dog, and we had her in her cage out in the mudroom, where we put our shoes on. She was pounding inside her cage and crying, but I don't know how to open her cage door, so I couldn't let her out, and after a little bit, I heard a loud rumble tell me, leave now. At that point I almost crapped myself, and ran up my stairs, back to my room, and I heard my dog getting louder, and hear her barking, and banging, and crying. I have bad dreams about them, such as this one I vividly remember. 
where I was at the bottom of my stairs, and I was taking a timed photo on my phone, which would make it take multiple photos, since I have an iPhone. But when I looked back at them, I saw this black shadow crawling down my stairs after me. And it looked nothing like the one I can see in the reflection of it. And it chased me around until I woke up. About two days later, I had a dream about it again, where there was a black shadow inside my closet that I was trying to keep inside. But at the end, he got out and started crawling after me. And then I woke up. I know it sounds crazy, but it is all true. This happened in my childhood and teen years, back when I was living in Venezuela. I am now 29 years old and living in the United Kingdom. My parents are originally from Portugal, but immigrated to Venezuela looking for a better life. We lived in a massive apartment complex with over 30 different apartments. My mum was close friends with a couple of neighbours from the ground floor as we lived on the third. These two neighbours were brother and sister. The brother lived alone with a husky, while the sister lived with her two sons who were really good friends of mine. Now it's important to point out that the sister was a divorced mum whose ex-partner was a very wealthy truck company owner. She had everything paid for by her ex-partner, from the apartment she lived in to daily groceries and anything she needed. After all, she was bringing up his two sons. Now, ever since I can remember, my mum and the sister would always lightheartedly joke about a ghostly apparition they named Francisco. I must preface by saying, that I have neither recollection or don't think I ever have seen Francisco myself, but recall them saying he was a smartly dressed man with a moustache that was always seen walking around the apartment complex. I recall multiple times where my mum and or sister would point out that they could see Francisco, and I was not able to see him myself. Now, Francisco appeared to be a friendly ghost, and was never threatening to anyone. However, Francisco's presence was mainly felt in the brother's apartment, who lived right next to his sister. The brother always used to joke that he and Francisco were roommates and never felt threatened by him. He used to tell us that at night he could hear Francisco running around the house, opening closets and cabinet doors, and that he was so active that he would yell at him to shut up and take a shower and watch TV. He would then either hear all the taps in the bathroom open, and or the TV turning on. Multiple times throughout my childhood, I recalled playing with their sons in the corridor, and hearing loud noises coming from the brother's apartment when there was no one there. Whether that be furniture clashing, doors opening and shutting, to loud sounds of glass and plates being smashed. Most of the time, we would inform the sister who would check the apartment, and confirm that everything was fine. This continued for a few years, with nothing major to mention apart from the above. Suddenly, the activity began to increase with a lot more apparitions and the brother mentioning that Francisco was a lot more restless and active than usual. His own husky would cower in the corner when in the house, terrified of being alone. And this is the first time weird things started to happen. The sister would be involved in a massive car crash where she was lucky to come out alive. The eldest of her sons fell down a huge flight of stairs, breaking his leg and cracking a few ribs. And finally, her mum came to visit her and her sons for a few days. She was around 50 years old and healthy. One evening, while sitting at home with her daughter and grandsons, she had a sudden heart attack and passed away. This shocked everyone, as she had no reports of heart issues and had been completely fine up until that moment. Things went back to normal in the following weeks. Shortly after that, my parents decided to move to another city, 
and I completely forgot about Francisco and the things that happened. Years later, the sister and brother also moved out, but something surprising happened. It was common knowledge that Francisco lived with her brother, or at least that's where he was most active. But Francisco tagged along following the move. He went with the sister rather than the brother. Now most of this has been told to me by my mum, as she kept in close contact with the sister. But from what she remembers, it's that following the move, Francisco started going absolutely crazy in the new house. From cabinet doors and shelves opening and closing frantically, to objects being thrown around the house. The sister had been harmed a few times by scratches along her back, and almost every night the duvet would be pulled off while she slept. It got to the point where the sister and her sons would sleep in the same bedroom and pray every night for it to stop. One day, deciding that they couldn't live like this anymore, a priest was brought into the house and did a blessing. Immediately following the blessing of the house, her kitchen caught fire, but thankfully it was contained to just that area. The cause of the fire was determined to be a candle that was lighted to a cross of Jesus Christ. Now the only way this would have caused a fire was if someone would have tipped it over intentionally. However, there was no one home and the windows were closed. So this was obviously blamed on Francisco. Around the same time, her youngest son was caught in a crossfire between the police and local gang, but he managed to get away from it unscathed. Following this, the sister and her ex-partner decided to speak with a local witch who dealt with white magic. The witch came to the house and immediately began to speak with Francisco out loud. It turns out the reason he was smartly dressed was because he was a dentist when alive and always liked to keep up appearances. He also died young, was buried at 30, and apparently someone had performed black magic using the earth from his grave and brought him back to the world of the living with one task, take one life with him every 10 years. The first life he took was the grandmother 10 years earlier, and it was coming up to the 20 year mark. It was the reason he was a lot more active and the weird things started happening again. But above all, he wanted to rest in peace. The witch managed to contain him to a jar and take him with her with the promise he will have a proper burial and will be able to rest in peace. He was apparently temporarily released in her backyard, which he went absolutely crazy on smashing things and breaking windows before being buried and put to rest. Now, it has been theorized by my mum and the sister that this could have only been done by the new wife of the sister's ex-partner. She hated the sister and her sons because they were living off her husband and both had multiple raging arguments, cursing each other and wishing death on the other. The sister believes the new wife must have spread the cursed dirt on one of her pot plants when she came to visit with her ex-partner. It's a long story, but one I always use when someone claims to not believe in the paranormal. I love having my mum tell the story and seeing the look on their face. A little backstory. I go to school about six hours from my hometown. The drive to and from school is along a long and mostly empty stretch of interstate through the desert. There are at least two military bases along the drive, and a major nuclear plant is also located near the interstate. The area is known for weird sightings, especially at night. Aside from that, it's mostly cactuses, sand and cattle. I was driving home from school in late June of this year, and was able to leave around 6pm meaning I'd be able to make most of the drive in the dark and get home at around midnight. It didn't bother me. I liked driving alone and at night, and for the most part didn't really scare me. It gives me a sense of independence and adventure. About three hours into my drive, I get to the other side of the second military base. At this point it's pitch black, and for the most part I was on the road alone. 
I saw the occasional car going the opposite direction. But other than that and my high beams, there weren't any other lights besides the moon. Somewhere around this time, I noticed a light paralleling me and my truck on the passenger side of my truck. I was doing around 95 and it kept up with me effortlessly. I wasn't along the railroad tracks and there was no road over there, just desert and shrubs. It was not very close to me and it was above the horizon. So I assumed it was something related to the military base and ignored it. Other lights appeared and was driving along with the original light. There weren't flares and I doubt there were military aircrafts since I didn't think most of these would be equipped with one white light I'd be able to see. The lights were there for about an hour, just following the road, keeping a perfect pace with my truck. I lost them when I started going north on a small local highway. I've never seen anything like it before or since on the many times I've made that drive, and it makes the hairs on my arms stand up just thinking about it. This story was told to me by my grandfather and told to him by his friend while he served in the Vietnam War. This is going to be told in the point of view of my grandfather's friend. Before I was drafted, I was working on a farm in Alabama. All my life, I've been working on a farm with family and friends. We never had much money. So about 20 of us had to live in an old plantation house. On the property, there was an old barn where we kept the workhorses, one mule and a few hogs. Next to the woods were some old slave houses that some of our friends lived in. Every morning as the sun rose, we rose. For breakfast, we ate whatever was for dinner the night before. We didn't have time to sit and wait for food to be cooked. Us kids had to work with the women so we mostly just picked whatever was being harvested that year. Basically, I'm telling you it was hard work. We always had strange things happen to us. We were pretty much in the middle of nowhere, and the only time we'd seen new faces were when we went to town in our wagon to sell our vegetables. We couldn't just call 911 because we didn't have a single telephone. We didn't even have lights. We used candles and lanterns. The little bit of money we had wouldn't pay for electricity. One winter night, we were all settled down after a day of harvesting hay. The men were sitting around the fireplace smoking pipes, chewing tobacco and talking. The women were either talking to each other or reading some of the magazines we had brought from town. Me and the other children were laying in our beds whispering to each other playing little games while trying not to be heard by the adults downstairs. At about this time of night, one of the men had walked outside to the outhouse, which was behind the main house next to the forest. As he was reaching it, he heard an owl hooting from the trees. He didn't think that was weird, owls were common, but the thing that made him stop walking was how the owl's hoot changed to a coyote howl. After that, it became a donkey braying, and after that it was a high-pitched whistle. The man yelled into the woods, thinking and hoping it was just someone playing a trick. He walked back into the main house and peed beside the porch, even though the women told him not to do it in the past. He didn't care about what they had to say. He didn't feel right about using the outhouse at that moment. About half an hour later, the dog starts barking. The men shrug it off, thinking it's a deer or something, but the barking got worse. It almost sounded like the dog was barking at an intruder. And then, just as suddenly, the dog stopped barking. The men knew something was up. So did the women. So a few of them went outside to check on the dog. When they found the dog behind the barn, its belly was ripped open, and its tongue appeared to have been bitten off. They knew a coyote didn't do this, nor a bobcat. One of the men picked up the corpse of the dog, 
and they all walked back to the main house to get a rifle and bury it. As they were burying the dog, the horses inside the barn started raising hell. The men knew whatever it was that killed the dog was now after the horses. So they ran into the barn and ripped open the door. They calmed the horses and searched the barn for the animal. And as they were searching, one of the men pointed that all of the horses tails were braided. At about the time he pointed this out, they heard footsteps in the hayloft. Two of the men rushed to climb the ladder. But when they got to the top, they found no one. Everyone knew what had visited the farm that night. It is known for witches to braid the tails of horses. It is known for them to make weird sounds to draw in their prey. It's a story that I'll never forget. It's something that will always make my skin crawl. It was the fall of 2009. My fiance and I had been living in our 1953 bungalow for a few months. She had been complaining that something had been messing with her at night, touching her face, her feet, sitting on her chest. One night, she ran out of the bedroom screaming, saying that it was messing with her again, and that she saw a tall shadow figure. I blew her off. I'd had plenty of my own paranormal experiences since I was 10, and I didn't want any more. But then about two weeks later, I went to bed late. She was already asleep. I climbed into bed and looked over my shoulder towards the bathroom door. There stood a seven foot shadow figure. I immediately tried to debunk it by looking at the light coming from under the door from the living room. The bathroom light was not on and there was foil over the window since I worked nights and slept during the day. I then looked back towards it. It was standing there motionless. Next, I glanced to the left of it, at our closet. It was a large walk-in, with a green tapestry hanging on a rod for a door. The light was on on the inside, and what did I see? Floating in the closet was a demon. It had scales like reptiles. Its arms were outstretched, with thumbs pointing down. It was rotating its head to the left and right. The best I can describe its face was hissing or seething. It had no legs, floating from the waist up. I watched it for a few seconds, just long enough to notice every detail of its skin and face. Then I laid down and immediately fell asleep. I am not religious and have never had any thoughts of demons before this moment. I witnessed two terrifying beings right before my eyes. Why did I just lay down and go to sleep? I think it had control over my mind. Sure, I've been to war a few times, but I'm not that brave. I later began to think maybe a djinn attached itself to me when I was in Iraq. I've had issues with extreme anger, rage, depression, and anxiety ever since to the point of an arrest. It's weird because I'm actually into Buddhism, meditation and helping people, but there's the other side of me now. If anyone had ever seen a demon like this, I'd love to get in touch. I'm now going through a divorce. In the last month of our relationship, I noticed on two occasions that my ex-wife's pupils were slit like a reptile or a cat. In our 10 years, I have never been afraid to say anything to her, but for some reason in those two moments, I didn't say a word. This happened back in the fall of 2015. At the time I was doing long distance with my girlfriend and was loving the bachelor life. That meant crappy YouTube rabbit hole documentaries, ancient aliens, the whole nine yards. No drugs at all. So I'm four hours deep into Stephen Greer's video, and he's talking about what he does out in the desert with some of his followers. And I totally expected this to look fake, but it really did seem like they were seeing UFOs. 
and were able to invite slash summon them for lack of a better term. And Dr. Greer talks about how if you want to have an experience, you can do this on your own. So I did. I was feeling brave. Aliens scare me, but after four hours of Dr. Greer telling me they're so nice, I figured what the hell? Let's give it a shot. The results were as follows. So it must have been around 1 to 2 a.m. I'm laying in bed before I go to sleep, and I picture myself directly above where I am laying, on the roof of my house, shooting a floodlight into the sky from the top of my head. I forget if this was what Dr. Greer, or if that was something I picked up from somewhere else. Keep in mind, this is just me picturing slash visualizing. This is no X-Files stuff quite yet. And I'm asking the universe slash night sky slash aliens in my head, kind of like a radio, for an experience. And I make it very clear in my mind that I do not want to be scared, and that I get scared by the idea of aliens very easily. Eventually I fall asleep. What happens next is hard to describe. I wake up, and I'm sitting up in bed, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. I'm facing the door at a diagonal angle and I see this light. This light is like nothing I've ever seen before or since. It is the brightest, most penetrating light I've ever seen, but it didn't hurt my eyes to look at it. In fact, it was kind of nice. It was mostly gold with yellow, green, and blue rays coming out of it. Like, it couldn't make up its mind on what color it wanted to be. I've never done psychedelics, but I wonder if this is what people would describe if they choose to. There was a silhouette of two skinny little legs sitting in front of the light, kind of swaying a little. I couldn't tell you if this lasted 30 or 3 seconds. All that I remember is that I felt like, okay, that's neat, and went back to sleep unceremoniously. I didn't hear a voice in my head, at least I didn't think I did, and felt like I just wanted to go back to sleep. At the time, I wasn't scared in the slightest, which in retrospect, didn't make a lick of sense, as I suspect this little green or grey visitor wanted it that way and had a hand in it. The next day, I am cold sweating, and I'm not well to say the least. I barely show up to work, and while I'm at work I go through the motions and maybe say a sentence or two the entire day. Same thing for almost the entire week. The day after, I tried to draw what I saw and remembered, thinking it would help. I felt like I needed to. It was pretty much exactly what I had described to you. Conclusion. I had had a handful of dreams about aliens before. In all of them, I'm scared having a fight with no fight or flight reflex. So the dreams just ended up being Conan fests with me punching Grays in the face, terrified. During the dream, I wasn't scared at all, not even a smidge. I've never dreamed of me being off-world or anything like that. I also had cold sweats for days and made it difficult to talk about or even write about. My story seems pretty tame compared to some other accounts, but it is quite spooky. And I'd never have had sleep paralysis or sleepwalked. I was 17 at the time. Me and my stepbro were outside sneaking a smoke and just talking. It was wet out, and we were standing by a window with a mesh screen. I was telling him about conspiracies in Hollywood, mostly having to do with Satanism in the music industry, and the symbolism behind it. I told him about the pentagram, and he didn't know what it was. Instead of describing it to him, I began to draw one on the wet screen. As soon as I connected the circle, we both heard a deep, guttural growl directly behind us. We both looked back, and saw nothing but an open field. We then competed to be the first one through the back door, shoving match style, and to this day, I don't mess with pentagrams, as I don't want to accidentally summon another demon. I live on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada. About midway up the coast, 
I was driving my girlfriend back to her granddad's house, two towns over from mine. It's about a two and a half hour drive on the highways. I had driven her home and spent the day visiting her family. This town she is from is right on the coast. It's a port city. The point is that I'd spent the day there and was now getting ready to drive home. On about 25 to 30 minutes into the drive, I'm on the highway that runs parallel to the mouth of the river on one side and the sea and tracks on the other. So it goes rail on my left, the road I'm on, and then a sort of mini channel where the river ends. I'm driving, it's getting dark, but I'm not tired or drowsy at all. There are a few rest stops along the road on my right, on the riverbank, and I need to slow down because I have to urinate. Then something scurries across the road. And that's almost all that happened. It was four legged at least from what I saw. Black. Blacker than black. Unnaturally dark. No texture or anything. It was void of light or colour, just in the shape that it was. It ran out of the bush over the rails, and I was going slow enough that the wind and the highway noise was gone, and I heard it. It sounded like metal tapping as it ran over the ballast and rail. Then the sound if you took a rod or rebar and stabbed it into the ground, then metal again as it ran in front of me, across the road. Its body was shaped like how some people described a UFO, almost flat-like, like an overall stretched out thing with legs protruding from the front and back. It had no features, no eyes, no face, nor mouth that I could tell, and it ran across the road, limbs stretching as it did so. Then it ran into the rest area and over into the bank, and I'm guessing into the river. I kept driving, and didn't go until I went home two hours later. I've tried searching for this thing online, but had no luck. If anyone could help me out in trying to figure out what it is, I'd seriously appreciate it. I've drawn a picture, and you'll find it in the description. Summer of 2017 is when I witnessed firsthand something dark. Me and my boyfriend at the time had a friend called Ashley that we would visit a lot. She lived in a large apartment building on the second floor. She also mentioned her downstairs neighbor a few times to us. She was kind of creeped out by the lady who lived there since she never once saw her leave her apartment within the six months she already resided there, and had no idea what she even looked like. She had a sign on her door that stated, protected by witchcraft, and had tiny mirrors hanging in all her windows, with the reflection sides facing outwards. She told us that she always heard birds screaming in the middle of the night, daily nearly, Curious about all this, we decided to go downstairs to take a peek at the sign on her door. My ex then informed me that he had an extremely bad vibe as soon as we stepped into the hallway, and couldn't stay another minute in that building. It wasn't until the maintenance men went into the apartment that we realised we were not wrong or crazy for being nervous and slightly afraid of this woman. Two men were making their rounds to each unit, providing everyone with fresh light bulbs. When the men get to Ashley's apartment, one of them looked ghostly white from fear, and had told her that when they entered the apartment below, they instantly felt an evil presence within. The woman had painted her walls black, and added red symbols all around, including the floor and ceiling. She didn't have any furniture besides a mantle surrounded by candles, and had a room that was chained up that she refused to let them go into. This room had a window that happened to be right next to the front entrance, so there's no avoiding having to walk by it if you wanted to get inside. One night, we decided to pay Ashley a visit in the middle of the night. I had an urge to take a picture of the windows with the mirrors, so I could prove I wasn't lying when I told the story about her. 
as we walked to the front entrance, we both noticed right away that the light was on in the mysteriously locked room. While waiting for Ashley to let us into the building, all that I could hear was the sound of a screaming bird. If I took a guess, I'd say it was a crow. But I have never in my life heard any kind of birds making that noise. I went to double check the time and saw that it was 3.30am. Being freaked out by this resulted in us cutting our visit short and not visiting her as often anymore. On our way home, I looked at the picture I took. While analyzing, I noticed that every window mirror was gleaming off the streetlights, except for one. Instead, the first window to the left looked to be a distorted face peering out of it, and seemed like it was created by smoke. This made me feel extremely uneasy every time we went back. I couldn't help but feel like that woman was a danger to us all and everyone who lived nearby. I'm just happy Ashley no longer lives there, and I don't have to be afraid of being cursed anymore. About 10 years ago, though I remember this like it were yesterday, I was visiting San Francisco with a couple of friends. We were staying in the attic of my friend's son in the Castro. It was somewhat late at night, maybe 10 p.m., and we were just chilling in the attic, three of us. Lights dimmed, so my friend was texting someone on her phone, and every time her phone lit up, a demonic figure would appear behind her, clear as day, almost hovering or hunched over her. He was standing right at me with a huge smile. Sometimes he was laughing, but there was no sound. I interpreted him as evil based on general appearance and demeanour. He was mocking me, mocking my fear. Our eyes were locked, and I was in complete disbelief. When her phone dimmed, he vanished. When it lit back up, there he was. I was completely terrified yet silent. I kept expecting him to disappear, and for me to realise it was an illusion. But that never happened. I had to finally break the eye contact to tell my friend about him. She freaked out, stood up, and started crying, and proceeded to call her parents, who then prayed on speakerphone in the room. Appearance. Almost just like a middle-aged man, but painted red. Weird, I know, but he was glistening a bright red colour. He was bald, and had a very stereotypical demonic appearance. His laugh was extremely creepy. But again, inaudible. I can't believe not only that it happened, but that I've gone so long without digging deeper for answers. Recently, the topic of ghost sightings came up, and I told this story, only to realise I've never come to terms with it. I'm very eager to hear people's perspectives, and also, I'm a little afraid if I can summon him back if I think too much about him. This isn't my story, but one a friend told me not long ago that I found fascinating, mostly because of the genuine emotion in his telling of it. The fear in his voice, and on his face, was visceral and contagious as he told the story, even though it happened years ago when he was a kid. About 15 years back, a friend of mine and his group of friends were out, having their fun of our little Ross Belt town not too far from a big city, doing all the things kids do before they discover drugs and girls, and all the other things that take you out of your childhood sense of adventure. In particular, they went out into this part of town we call the Flats, originally zoned industrial, but after the big fibre plant closed, nature reclaimed the place for the most part. So it was fields and woods once, but you got past the big dilapidated factories that sit by the tracks. For obvious reasons, the parents around there tell their kids to keep well away from that area, because it could be seriously dangerous. But the thing that strikes me as odd about this part of town is that there have been constantly been rumours 
that there was some kind of waste material that's just buried out there that's toxic, allegedly radioactive, and or related to the Manhattan Project. It's become local folk wisdom that there's something out there you don't want to get into, since my dad was a kid in the 50s. My friend and his posse were playing Manhunt, which I'm told is basically hide and seek. And so he was going through the woods looking for his friends who were hiding pretty successfully from him. He reaches a break in the trees, steps out onto a small meadow, and that's when he sees it. Across the field, about 20 yards away, there was something squatting in the tree line, clad in all silver and a bulbous helmet, looking almost like some astronaut from a D-grade sci-fi flick. It saw him in the same instant he saw it. It leapt in surprise, but there was something off and almost simian about the stance it took up when it leapt, almost like a chimp in a spacesuit, but taller and close to a human. Just as quickly, it raised its arm, pointed, and somehow fired a tiny metal dart at my friend, which hit him in the hand as he turned to run. He ripped the thing out of his hand while running and screaming for his friends. As he told me this with a shaky voice, he showed me the small scar on his hand. I'm a skeptical person, and it's a cheesy story. But this is a guy who's not capable of faking the trembling voice and faraway look of someone who's remembering something that terrified them. I insisted we go look around that place after hearing this, but we found nothing strange, except for a weird looking warehouse type building closer to the freeway than the woods that was relatively new, an empty wilderness. To this day, I have no clue what he saw, but I believe he did see something. Ever since I was a kid, I was prone to seeing things. Ghosts. Some unexplainable creatures. I sleepwalk and say some confusing weird things. My mother has noticed it a lot, and my friends have mentioned it many times. I am super empathetic and can feel energy. It affects me a lot. So I've been seeing this humanish creature in my dreams. He is extremely tall, well-dressed, and terrifyingly handsome. His eyes are some unnatural color, and frankly, as soon as I wake up, I forget his face. A few months ago, I started seeing him outside my dreams. I woke up at 3 or 4 a.m. for no reason, and start seeing him either standing near the end of my bed or on my mirror. He just stares at me, and then he walks out or disappears, and the place where he usually stands feels cold all the damn time. It keeps happening. I wouldn't say I'm extremely scared, curious even. His energy feels inviting, yet terrifying. Well, last night I saw him again. My mother was sleeping in my room. He was standing near the mirror once more. I got up, put on my robe, and walked up to him. He is extremely tall. I could barely reach his shoulder at five at seven. I tried to touch him, and he reached out his hand and I blacked out and woke up in my bed. I figured it was just a crazy dream. But then my mother mentioned how I was murmuring about a man standing near the mirror, and heard me get up while she was half asleep. I'm not on any medication or hallucinogenic drugs. I don't drink often, and consider my mental health to be relatively healthy. Except for the occasional panic attacks. Am I going insane? Is it a demon? A ghost? How can I contact it? I am not making this up. Frankly speaking, I wish I was. I am just very confused and would appreciate some proper answers. While visiting my family in the island of Lombok, Indonesia, I heard of what I believe to be known as a witch called Leuk, fall from the sky onto the roof. I have lived in Australia my whole life, but my dad who is from Indonesia has family over there. 
three years ago, I, along with my mum, dad, and sister, were staying with my dad's family, and something creepy happened. We were sleeping in a back room of my uncle's deli under a corrugated iron ceiling. The room was small and only had one small window, which was just a square cut out, with four or five metal rods in it, like you imagine a jail cell would have. The window had a small curtain over it. In the middle of the night, my whole family and I suddenly awoke to an extremely loud bang on our roof, followed by scratching. The sound was too loud to be created by something as large as a dog or cat. There were no trees for an animal to jump or fall from, and my mum, who has never experienced anything paranormal living in Australia her whole life, became a little worried. Even she was suspecting something otherworldly. My dad wasn't surprised though. He told me many stories of the supernatural while he lived in Indonesia. The next morning, my dad told his brother and sister about what happened. They weren't surprised. They told him that recently, almost every night, liaks have been running around on people's roofs. They described them as humans with crow-like wings, running, flying, and screaming. Pretty much next to my uncle's deli in our land, there is a village which has their own culture and beliefs. My other uncle married a woman from that village, so our family are quite close with the people. In that village, there is a shaman, and a man and woman called Dukun. They're an old couple, and the villagers always go to them with a problem regarding spirits or the supernatural. The wife is a small old lady whose teeth are stained a reddish black, due to chewing on betel nuts all day long. The husband, I can't remember his appearance. My family visited them once because they wanted to perform some type of ritual with us, perhaps a cleansing or something. My dad told me the Dukan suspected that there were a few liaks in the area. A lady and her mother lived in the house next door to my uncle's deli, and they were the ones who were suspected. They thought it was best that they just keep it to themselves and not accuse the ladies of something like this. The creepy thing is, the neighbor's house was next to our room, right where the small window was. In the few nights that I stayed there, I was sleeping right next to the window, and I had a terrible night's sleep. I woke up with a very bad heat rash and was very uncomfortable. My dad told me that several times in the night, he noticed the curtain on the window open, and even though he kept closing it, he had a strange feeling that someone was looking in. After a bit of information about these legs, we were told that they're humans who practice in black magic, causing them to turn into supernatural beings. In each region of Indonesia, there are different types of creatures like this with different names and appearances. But in Bali and Lombok, it is known as Leak. During the day, they appear as normal human, but at night, they leave the house and do whatever they wish. I have experienced many more stories from my dad, and they are all quite haunting. For context, I am a Christian. I was at the grocery store doing the usual shopping, and in comes this woman. She was wearing a giant backpack and jogging attire. From the get-go, you could hear her mumbling and talking to herself. I reckoned she was probably schizophrenic. It got worse, though. She was more aggressive and started shouting, telling the voices to stop and leave her alone and that they've been dead for 15 years. People were noticing, so they moved away. The staff avoided her uncomfortably. So I get the idea. Maybe if I pray for her, I thought I'd ask God to free her from this thing. Something like, let her in Jesus' name get out of there. I was standing way off behind her as I whispered, so she couldn't possibly have heard me. But just as I said amen, the woman abruptly said out loud to herself, She belongs to us. 
You won't get us out of here. She's ours. Go away. You don't have the right. This was really loud. I've prayed for people before, but I did not expect that, and honestly was very shocked. I was so surprised, I paid and left. I wasn't ready for a fight. I might try again if I get the opportunity, but that is certainly one of the more interesting paranormal experiences I've ever happened. So, to the woman who may or may not have a demon in her head, I'm going to pray for you and hope you're okay. This encounter happened to a family friend. He said this occurred somewhere in Italy when he was 15. Walking home from a friend's house through a wooded area, a craft appeared hovering above the trees and approached him. He didn't give a description of the craft or say if it landed or not, but told me there were people inside. I'm not sure if he could see into the craft or if they left the vehicle, but he said they were around four to five feet tall. I asked if he was scared, but he said no. He was very excited and overwhelmed with happiness. He said he waved and they waved back, then spoke to him. Again, I'm not sure if he meant verbally or telepathically. And he said they invited him to go with them, far away. But he politely declined, stating he was happy here and didn't want to leave. They departed in the craft and he hurried home, excitedly telling his mother of his encounter. She wasn't pleased to hear his story, and told him never to tell anyone else. They would think badly of him, and also possibly of her. I'm not sure if she even believed him or not. He told me this story with tears in his eyes, saying he was grateful for the experience, and still remembered the overwhelming joy he felt at the time. I'd known him since I was a young child, and trusted him completely. He was always very serious and never joked or lied as far as I knew. His story surprised me, as I'd never expected him to be the type of person to experience something like this. His emotion in telling me convinced me even more than just trusting his honesty. I'd never seen him so emotional on any other occasion, which made this so much more significant to me. I saw a demon 12 years ago. I had recently been arrested and had posted bail. I had thoughts of suicide, despair, hopelessness. I was asleep and woke up in the middle of the night. At the end of my bed was a beautiful woman with long red hair. She just stood there looking at me, and her hair seemed to float around her, as if she were in water. There was no noise and I was speechless as to why such a beautiful woman was in bed with me. She smelled sweet. In a blink, her eyes went black, her hair disappeared, and her face sunk into itself, as if I were looking at a long dead person. The room smelled of earth, electricity, and rotting wood. She jumped up and floated in my room, then she screamed. The sound vibrated my toes, and was so loud, it was the sound of fear, of hate, and disgust. I, being a 30-year-old male, hid under the sheets until the scream stopped. Then, an earthquake hit. I live in Indiana, and there are never any earthquakes here. And she was gone. I started going to church regularly the next day, and have never stopped. I've never seen her again, and never felt an evil presence in that way either. I have never known fear like that, and I pray I never will again. Hand to God this happened. I keenly remember every minute of that event. Earlier this year during the spring, my wife had planned a trip with an older woman who she befriended. They had been friends even before I first met my wife. She had mentioned to me before that her friend was a witch and routinely performed rituals with animal limbs. I don't know anything about witches to be honest, but what I experienced 
leads me to believe that she's bad news. I've yet to meet her in person. But strange things have happened after she visited our apartment. My wife's friend drove to our apartment early one Thursday morning, so that they could carpool to their destination. I work during the afternoon and into the night, so her knocking woke me up. My wife was already awake and greeted her at the door. They had a brief conversation in the living room and were on their way. After they left, I had a hard time returning to sleep, so I tried to kill some time on my phone. It was just after 9am when I felt some unusual vibrations underneath my bed. I was confused at first and thought I was experiencing an earthquake. The vibration then turned into what I can only describe as someone kicking my mattress from underneath it. I sat up in bed and carefully observed other objects in the room to see if they were also shaking and to see if this really was an earthquake. Nothing else in the room was affected. No later than 10 seconds after sitting up, I felt my king sized mattress come up off the bed frame about two to three inches and lightly lean from left to right. After that, the mattress settled back on the frame. My body became unusually warm, and I was too scared to jump out of bed, fearing something would grab my ankles as soon as I touched the floor. This is coming from someone I know. A few years back, he was on his deathbed in the hospital. He had cat scratch fever, but one of those rare cases of it, so he said. He was praying out to God to save him from death, because he had been told he had just a few days left to live. And he said that he felt like God wasn't going to answer his prayers. So he said, I don't care who saves me, but I want someone to. Then this lady in a black dress with a crow on her shoulder suddenly appeared at the foot of the hospital bed. He said he knew right away that she was a demon. She told him that she would save slash heal him if he would believe in her, and he said he would. He then described that she came to the side of his bed, reached into his chest, and he said he felt her grab his heart and squeeze it for a few seconds, as binding pain covered him, and then she disappeared. When the doctors came to check back in on him, they found him fully recovered. He says that he sees this demon every Halloween, and that she sometimes is surrounded by dogs, either standing besides or in front of her. I don't have any more information about that. I've tried looking it up but haven't found anything. I work with a guy from Mexico, and he used to tell me crazy stories about the country. The one that scares me the most is the one about the white dress witch. While in Mexico, he said every year, once a year, around three in the morning, he would wake up, and in the corner of his room, he would see a lady in white. He would be so freaked out that he couldn't do anything except stare and cry at her. So after he told me that, I told him, yeah, right. Then he told me he saw her in the back of our chemical plant on graveyards at three in the morning. Again, I shook it off until I had to go back there and mess with some dryers. As I was walking back, I look back and I see white sheets flowing in the wind. So I stopped, and that's when I realized it was a lady in a dress with white hair. I didn't think I'd ever run so fast in my entire life. Of course, when I got back to the shift, I told them what I saw, and no one believed me except my friend from Mexico. Ever since then, I've been seeing more and more weird and unusual things in the plant, and now my home. There is a known demon house in my area, and I assume that by passing this, this is where it first attached to me. This demon first manifested itself to me when I was 13, 
and followed me pretty consistently until I was 17. It could never physically get to me. Something was mostly keeping it at bay. There was never physical harm. It just attacked my psyche. I believe I was born with psychic gifts, medium and clairvoyancy. But the longer the demon was attached, the more I lost touch with these gifts. So after a while, I hired a medium to see if I could get answers regarding the demon. And long story short, she said it was an extremely powerful one, and she refused to speak to it. So I never learned its name. But she informed me, the reason it couldn't get to me was because an ancient ancestor who was a warlock kept him at bay. With all that said, I still saw this demon in my dreams and in dark hallways. It always wore a black cloak. Occasionally there were things coming from its shoulders. I assumed those were wings, and it had dark red eyes. Now I've never been able to get answers on this. Any help would be much appreciated. Another thing it did, it would make me see things, such as rows of shadows on both sides of the road at night, watching me. I haven't seen it in three years, but I do still feel it. My father's girlfriend told of this experience. When she lived alone in an apartment, she once fell asleep in the living room with the lights still on. She suddenly woke up super late into the night and saw this human-like creature staring at her. It was super short like a child, but had a large head and huge ears flapping between them, up and down to float in the air. It had this grotesque grin, and she was basically frozen in fear. After a few moments, the creature just disappeared into thin air. She also had other stories of waking up in the night to something invisible choking her violently. A few years ago, my mum was sleeping downstairs and she had an encounter with something inhuman. I always used to get scared at night and knock on their door to sleep with them. And one night, my mum heard a knock on her door, and she assumed it was me. So she said, come in while still half asleep. She heard the door open, and heard something quickly patter across the ground and jump on the bed. And it began whispering in her ear, mimicking her voice. She freaked out, opened her eyes to see a very skinny, small, webbed-looking creature running out the room. Me and my dad awoke to her screaming. We believed the house was haunted because we all had paranormal experiences in the house. The previous owners were drug addicts who performed satanic rituals and the like. When I showed her a picture of a skinwalker, she said that it looked similar, but we don't know if this was a skinwalker, demon, or malevolent spirit. My grandfather used to be the equivalent of a ranger down in Mexico. He was in charge of patrolling the farms and lands, mainly due to people growing weed. One day he said he was patrolling this ranch late at night, during the night shift, and he heard a baby crying. Now the land is pretty flat, so he looks everywhere and saw nothing. Maybe it was some goats out in the distance. They sound like crying babies sometimes, and as he's walking his route, he hears the same sound. Looks up in the sky, and he swears he saw a witch, with black clothes and everything, flying towards a mountain. He panicked, ran to his car, and drove off as fast as he could. Personally, I don't believe him, and my family thought he was high. My family has a weird thing with always having ghosts around us. Not sure why, it's always just been that way. My sister has been seeing this one figure for a long time. She said it has chalky white skin with black eyes. She sees it around a lot. 
It has round ears and a round head. We call it monkey because it kind of looks like one. She has a lot of dreams, a few I can remember her telling me, about being almost always about to get her killed. One time, she saw herself bloated and dead. Multiple times, have had to do with knives. And others, she saw the basic idea of the devil. If you don't know, but you know something or someone that could help, I'd appreciate it. I really don't know who to turn to.